Hi, my name is Peter. I'm an emergency resident working in Stockholm, um, originally from Denmark, and I want to talk to with you about a um, topic that all emergency physicians um, need to know something about today, um, but not all emergency physicians maybe work with in their daily um, routine. I'm talking about uh, critically ill children. And this is not a lecture where I will go through um, all of the minute, minute details of the medical uh, management of children, but it's mainly the critically ill children. So the ones that are in the um, resource bay. And um, this lecture I've done uh, straight after I, I did my uh, ePALS course. Um, and it's also kind of a lecture where I, I'm going through kind of the ePALS way of thinking about this. Um, and and it, can, it can be used as a um, kind of a 101 before you go to the ePALS course, what you want to read up on as well. Um, I've also done the European trauma course and um, as I think the ePELS course is lagging a little bit in the trauma uh, part, um, I will be um, supporting the ePELS bit with um, some trauma uh, stuff from the ETC course as well. All of this is packed into a um, lecture where I uh, as always, want to talk a bit about probabilistic thinking, but mainly it's it's for your pediatric um, rotation, um, so you know how to take care of the most critically ill. Um, and for the more common stuff you see in the emergency department with children, um, I strongly encourage you to check up your local guidelines, or I might be able to give you some suggestions on where to go um, for... Um, for uh, free online access medical medical education about that as well and just before we head into it epals is european pediatric als uh, and etc is european trauma course um, and we'll be focusing on children today the critically ill one all right as always, I want to show you the references that uh, are essential here, and these are the ones that um, I'm building a lot of the um, the knowledge in this lecture on. The uh, ePALS uh, book from 2021, maybe it's 2023 now. The um, European Trauma Course from 2021, and the ERC guidelines from 2021, and then the Danish Danish Pediatric um, guidelines. I want to quickly show you that these Resuscitation Council UK guidelines that builds um, and translates this big doc, these big documents from ERC and make it more manageable for the average clinician. Um, th these are, if you only read one thing, then these are probably it. Because these are uh, digestible, digestible and algorithmicized in a really, really good way. So um, check these out first if you want to go into this uh, topic. All right, then foam. There are so many foam um, <laughs> foam uh, um, pages about children. Um, I want to just highlight a few. Don't forget the bubbles. It's not necessarily critically ill children, but it's all children, and they have a great um, YouTube channel that I strongly encourage you to check out. EM cases has for a long while been one of the best go-tos for um, high quality um, talks about uh, children, also neonates, and they have a free ebook also on this topic. Um, for this year's Sweets, which is the Swedish um, like yearly um, conference on emergency medicine, there was some great lectures, and I've linked them over here for you of for you who talk Swedish or understand Swedish, for, uh, from Astrid Lindgren, where, which is the, uh, one of the big centers in Stockholm or in Sweden that sees these children's trauma, and they have a great like one-on-one lecture um, on trauma in children. 
And then on the pain management, I will not go into the pain management in children in this lecture because that's not actually part of the EPALS course, but it's really something that is really, really important when you are doing or rotations. And it's usually something that needs to be done quite um, professionally and with confidence so that the parent is aware that you know what you're doing. Um, because it's a, it's a thing that creates a lot of panic. And so I will not go through that, uh, but it's hugely, hugely important. Um, and I would encourage you to either check this lecture out or look at the Danish guidelines from the Dansk Pediatric Silscape, because they have um, great advice on both the non-pharmacological and the pharmacological part. So um, even I have done, um, I haven't done my rotation yet in pediatric uh, pediatrics, but I have been a, um, I have I've worked in pediatric emergency medicine uh, previously, um, and um, yeah, I will mainly be focusing on the critically ill uh, here and, and not sharing any more general advice on how to manage children. That may be a different lecture for a different time. And then just a few links down here below. This um, link here is one of the big like articles on how to manage children. If you want the, uh, it's from the horse's mouth. Um, then as always, I cannot, uh, I cannot not uh, bring in uh, human factor stuff, non-technical stuff, which is a big part of the European parts of these courses. So the EPELS and the ETC, um, they have a huge um, uh, emphasis on the teamwork and leadership and on non-technical skills. So if you're going to go through for those courses instead of the ATLS um, and the APLS, um, which are more focused on the individual and the capacity of uh, one doctor doing the examination and maybe in a rural setting, then, then you really need these non-technical skills for the European ones. Okay. Um, so just to be sure, uh, this is just a small cutout from the uh, ePELS book. And just to, say, just to show you, ePELS focuses on the first, um, the quick look and the primary, um, primary assessment and not on the secondary or the tertiary assessment, at least not, not a lot. Um, it's... Um, its main, main, main weight is on the first two steps here. So when you're doing the course, um, don't be too afraid to not know how to manage diabetic, diabetic ketoacidosis or stuff like that. It's the um, treat as you go part of the ABC algorithm, algorithm and not the more minute nuanced details that we are supposed to know about when we are emergency physicians in these settings. Um, all right. So, um, so uh, that was something that I, I would love to know before I went into the course. So um, here you go. All right. So um, the um, ePALS approach to the critically sick child, it looks like this. And I think, or, or sorry, I, I modified this to like to be a more general approach. And I, one that I, I think is usable in the real world as well um, for emergency physicians. So, all right. So... Always we have some kind of pre-brief. If, uh, if, if it's a critically ill child where we know it's a critically Ill, Ill child coming in and we have time to prepare our team, we'll do the pre-brief. And as a part of the pre-brief, both, both in the ATLS and, sorry, both in the ETC and the ePELS course, um, it's important to have this kind of, um, what you can call a zero point survey. Um, I'll give you the link for that later, but like where you have role allocation, you try to induce psychological safety so everyone can come in with their opinion if it's if it's needed. You um, go through what the report says and you uh, delegate tasks to um, to, uh, to delegate tasks to your team members and kind of make a plan for the first couple of minutes for what to prioritize. And then you prepare your equipment. So that, that's the STE is self that you're yourself are prepared, the team and then the equipment. I'll go into details about this later. Um, and then you do uh, maybe in an S bar fashion, you will do 
the like the history of the, uh, what what you what you're going to get and so you have a shared mental model to begin with about the patient that you're going to see and then specifically for the pediatrics <laughs> you will go through doses and if you have time you will kind of either use an app but it's actually i, I find it quite useful to write on a blackboard or a whiteboard um, the patient's weight and then you can kind of, kind of calculate also you want to keep track of if you have a lot of bleeding or something like that you have someone who needs to keep track of, of what you're giving and at what times so so for the on the blackboard or whiteboard you want to have someone writing uh, for these things if you have enough resources then when the patient comes you will um, go into what what epals calls bbb or, or what uh, a pls the american course um, calls the pediatric assessment triangle um, and if it's a trauma patient then the epals calls it the trauma quick look um, and if it's a trauma patient the in the adults uh, or in the etc course and then it's called the five second survey there are many names for these things and i would like them to have kind of the same name for um, these things and kind of but but it's it's very much before going into the a b c d e algorithm there are a few things that you need to do when the patient arrives just to make sure that they're not dying and that we are and, and so that's that's the, kind of the first part of that the second part of this is um, when you see the patient even though you did prepare for all the stuff then there are the three s's that we'll go through which are um, mainly uh, has something to do with whether we we are safe should we increase our safety in any way um is the patient safe like is there any danger for the patient should, are, are they in cardiac arrest um and uh, and 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 um do we have um a need for more help and then you kind of move into when you once you're done with that and you kind of move into oh either you go into um an ABCDE algorithm and this is where I differ from the EPELS course because I want always as emergency physicians us to have a parallel process kind of way going through this we want a, um, a treat as you go algorithm where we collect data and we kind of treat generically so if it's an A problem then we'll treat with um, um, sufficient um, a uh, adjuncts like an oropharyngeal airway or a nasopharyngeal airway a back valve masking or and so on jaw thrusts basic airway maneuvers um, without too much consideration of what the cause is and as but as we collect the data here we don't need many data points to get this syndrome kind of management going where we see oh i see a high potential high potential patient with a uh, with a um, who was red and he, who had a onset of symptoms really really fast. Well, that sounds kind of like an anaphylaxis, right? Um, or maybe, and I may collect a few more focused data points uh, just to get the, the treatment going. Because if I'm only treating generically with, if I had hypotensive, then hypotensive. Uh, if I have the hypotensive patient, then maybe I would generically treat with fluids, um, and that is good for buying time. That's like the treat as you go is buying time, and kind of. Um, um buying time and, and and collecting data whereas the syndrome management is worth the data and the buying time is supposed to um, give us time for, to do so that we can specifically treat someone with the syndrome that that we think it is and this is like an iterative process right you do one thing and then you reevaluate uh, you really evaluate the effect of what you've been doing and that's hugely important in the epals course especially because they mainly focus on this part um, so um, we reevaluate and then and usually there's not too the, the the cases are usually not so complex they're usually quite straightforward not that they're that it means that they're easy but um, they're usually quite straightforward so that there's not too many differential diagnoses to think about um, so so mainly it's it's like this part and then maybe a few like easy syndromes that oh you need to treat with adenosine here because this, this is a high 
or like this is a, um, a patient with an SVT. All right. Um, also from this, you may go into some kind of uh, algorithm where it's a cardiac arrest, right? So either you have a, a patient that is not in the cardiac arrest, then you go through this, and then you may have a patient who is in cardiac arrest, and then you go through this algorithm, okay? No matter what, when you're done in the scenarios and in real life, then you'll go through a sign out. So you, you can hear I'm, I'm, I'm talking about both real life and the course. So this is um, mainly for real life, but also like I'm just trying to show you how, um, how also to um, some of the things that the course will go through. But we're not doing the course for, um, for, um, for just the sake of doing the course. We're doing it for real life. So that's that's my like further development of the concept here for my own pri private private like practice. Okay, so that was the pre-brief that we just went through, um, and now we'll go to um, the next part of the kind of algorithm that we're following here. Um, so the next part will be the, um, once the patient has arrived, then you will uh, see that you, then you have what you can call a quick look or a BVB or a pediatric assessment triangle or yeah, where we kind of get a quick look at that there's nothing dangerous going on and we need to do something really quickly about before going into the ABCs. And if not, then we'll just, um, either head to the ABCs, um, while we're taking care of that quick thing, or we're heading to the pediatric um, CPR algorithm. Okay, so let's talk about this BBB quickly. Okay, so that's the algorithm that we're going to follow in the um, EPELS course, and also um, an algorithm that is actually um, translatable to the real life of an emergency physician. Um, so it's usable in the day-to-day -day life. Um, and I will just go through a few other essential concepts in real life and uh, um, and also in for the EPALS and ETC courses. All right, so um, one of these concepts is the concept of uh, doing the resuscitation either in a sequential manner or a parallel or simultaneously uh, manner. So most of us are used to, um, like if we're working in a smaller center, um, most of us are used to the sequential manner when you, where you have one doctor um, who's the team leader also doing the examination or maybe only one team leader and then one examining doctor and the examining doctor does, does the A, the B, the C and so on and so forth. And this is great. Um, this is great, especially if you have... Uh, if you have a resuscitation where there's not a lot going on or you don't have to do a lot of things at the same time. But, it, but once you have these uh, patients where they are critically ill, where you have a lot of things going on at the same time, for instance, in trauma, um, where you need to do lots of things at the same time, then uh, we can revert to this kind of structure. And we should look at this uh, as a tool in our toolbox like, uh, like um, sometimes we can do the sequential one, sometimes we can do the sim simultaneous one and uh, or the parallel one. And so the parallel one is where you have one team leader and then you delegate the A to one person and the B to one person and the C to one person. And then usually, um, uh, usually it would be the A person who does the D and the E. Um, and there's different ways of cutting up this cake, uh, cutting up these A, this A, B, C, D, E role delegation. Usually you also have a nurse um, or a, a, um, um, a fluid, a blood pressure, uh, a very vital, vital person, uh, which would usually be a nurse's assistant. And you will have someone uh, getting in fluids and so on and so forth. And that, that may be the C person, but may also be in connection with the nurse, um, calling the blood banks and so on and so forth. And you have, you have someone who's documenting. Then sometimes along with this team of teams or uh, smaller teams here, you will have uh, external teams co coming in to consult like a GYN, uh, OBG consult if you have a perimortem sex show, or you will have a team of pediatrics if you have someone to have a perimortem sex show and you need to get the child out and someone to resuscitate the child as well. So you may have to develop this mo model even further. 
um, the benefits of doing it everything simultaneously, like um, where the team leader, um, when the when the when the team starts working, then um, the A person does the A assessment and takes care of the treatment as well for the A, and then uh, calls back to the team leader and says, "Oh, uh, well, there's a um, there's no trauma to the head. Uh, there's a fr there's a uh, the mouth is free. There's no blood or uh, saliva or anything, and um, the trachea is is uh, in, in the middle." Okay, good. And then we go on to B, and then we go on to C. So they, this is in, in a callback fashion, right? And if there's any mission critical steps that needs to be taken, like an intubation, then the A person will tell the team leader that, oh, I'm going to do an intubation here. And then the team leader who has the overview can kind of and do an assessment of okay, should we prioritize that prioritize right, that right now, or should we first try to resuscitate through C to get the blood pressure up a bit maybe before doing the the um, intubation, and and then if if they're not sure, then they will bring it back to the entire team as a shared mental model and say okay, here's a t what you call a ten in ten, like a ten. Mm, seconds uh, summary every ten minutes, where you just say okay, this is the situation here. Um, this is where we are, this is where I think we're growing, um, but right now we need to consider should we intubate right now, and I think we should. Um, is everyone on board with that? And then they will do it um, if everyone is on board with that. So there's huge benefits of doing it in this fashion. Um, lots of things can happen at the same time, just like a Formula 1 car, um, but um, there's also um, high demands for what you call non-technical skills and a proficient team and team leader in these things. So um, I'll talk about these um, skills in, in the next slide here in depth. So yeah, and I guess from most emergency physicians will know uh, a cardiac arrest situation, right? That's actually where we are kind of stepping back and being the team leader like in this kind of fashion. So um, it, it's not as foreign as you may think going into this mode. And if you have a really ill patient that you started off like this, then you may sometimes have to revert to, or go, go, to, like, go to this mode as well. So it's, it's a tool in our toolbox, this. All right, so... All of this uh, about non-technical skills, which I love to talk about and I've done several videos on, is can, can, I think can be summarized in the resource bay um, as what Scott Weingart calls, Scott Weingart calls amateurs talk strategy, experts talk logistics. And what does that mean? Um, um, what I believe, or my interpretation of what Scott Weingart means, um, you can talk, watch this lecture and make up your mind as well, um, and his blogs on this. But amateurs talk strategy means that someone who is novice at resuscitation, they will know what to do as if they're answering a test, right? So um, the blood pressure is low. Okay, I will give, I will give fluid. I will get blood. Um, and they don't think too much about, well, how is this actually logistically going to happen? So they know what to do, but how is that going to happen? And that's what they mean about, that's what they, what Scott Weingart, Scott Weingart means about this last sentence, like experts talk logistics, because the expert will know that things just don't happen. You need to, to do a lot of things for, to make them happen. And what is the, like the, 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 the gap between knowing what to do and actually getting it done? That is where I think non-technical skills has an essential role in emergency medicine, in, in, sorry, in resuscitation. Um, um, because if you want that blood to be given, then you need to call the blood, you, you, need to, you need to communicate with a nurse, you need to say their name, you need to state what you want, and you need to make them do a closed loop so that you know when it's done that you, they, they come back and, and tell you what, what has been done, right? You need to prioritize that the blood is the, one, the thing that you need to be done right now and instead of something else, um, and so on and so forth, right? So we'll go through some of these essential non-technical skills in resuscitation um, in the next slides here. All right, so 
why am I talking about this uh, at all in this like um, EPELs and e e European Trauma Course inspired talk? Well, um, that's because that's a, like one of the like easy, main things that you'll be drilled on in these courses. That is your um, both your um, skills as a team leader and your skills as a team member, as well as like knowing the algorithm that we just talked about and, and getting through the case. But just as much you're going to be evaluated on your non-technical skills as a team member as, as, and, as, and, as, and a team leader. And I think that's really great. That's really essential because this is such an essential part of what we do. Um, so I'll just go through like uh, just a quick overview of the some of the most essential non-technical skills that I think every emergency physician should know about. And uh, I hope to do a um, even deeper dive at, at some point in, in these um, is this area because I, I love <laughs> talking about this. So, um, so let's talk about first of all like the team leader. So, the team leader, um, what are their responsibilities? Well, the team leader has the purpose of the team leader, especially in these parallel A B C D E teams. Um, the, the team leader needs to be hands off, right? They need to uh, like optimally stand on some kind of podium where where you can see them, and they do not touch the patient on this in, in specific circumstances, right? If they need to be, uh, because then they can keep their overview. They can, they have the overview of the patient, and their task one well, their main tasks is not to lose focus or not to be overwhelmed, like what you call cognitively loaded. Um, they should keep delegating tasks so that oh someone needs to look up this what is the dose of this well you um you look that up well you the person with the name look up that dose and come back to me when you have that dose the, the team leader doesn't do that oh we need to call radiology oh that is the documentation person you call radiology right so you delegate tasks you don't do the task because if you want once you do a task or once you touch the patient then you're what you would call what you would call head down and then you do not have the overview anymore if you at some point need to um do something critical that only you can do. Maybe you only you are the only one in the room who knows how to do a thing of thoracotomy, um, thoracostomy, or something else. Then you will um, then you will give the leadership to someone else um, in that time frame where you need to do that time critical task, and then you'll get it back once you've done it. Um, and so that's 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 really essential. Um, it's important for the team leader to assess. Like or sorry, so to state that they are the team leader, and this is sometimes hard if you have a t a team of very very senior staff, and you are in a new place and you're not you don't know anyone and you may be junior even. It's really hard to become like go in and be the team leader. But I encourage you to not fall into the trap of not saying anything uh, if you're the team leader, because if you don't state that you're the team leader, or at least say. Okay, it seems like we don't have a team leader right now. I will be the team leader. Um, if you don't say that, um, uh, then then there will be what what I usually call a leadership vacuum. Um, the small sub teams will just do whatever they want to do, and there will be no team leader, no one leading. And then sometimes, and not often, uh, sorry, not 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 random, not, not rarely. Uh, also, when we simulate and when I instruct people on this, um, if they don't have a clear team leader, um, the teams will just fall apart and they will do their own thing. And sometimes they will do something detrimental, like the A team are going to intubate and then the blood pressure tanks and they don't know why, like the other team members don't know why the blood pressure, blood pressure is going down. So it's so essential that we have someone who is leading the team and kind of coordinating everything. And if you if you, like and if you're not skilled at it, like if you're not skilled at this specific like case, then you can always say, well, um, I will if everyone is all right with it, I, I'll I, I I'm taking the team leader role. Uh, if not anyone else, uh, if if anyone else don't want it, and then you can like pause and then I'll take the team leader role. I'm not that skilled in this this like specific case, so I really need your help 
to your I need your eyes and ears and please come with comments or please come with um, information uh, if you're seeing something that um, is going on the wrong way or you want to inform us about that and that is the last part is what do we call psychological safety or creating psychological safety which is another part of the team leader role um, this is usually done through the sign in but it and it can be done like verbally or non-verbally through um, like these in, in essence this is all about lowering the hierarchy so that um, so that the team feels safe to come with comments or if something is going is going the wrong way they, they dare to speak up because then you can become strong as a team when the team leader can get feedback and can get um, opinions and discussions about where we're going um, so making this uh, like or um, getting an environment of psychological safety uh, usually just takes what it takes is just usually saying that oh i don't know where um as, uh, well once you've done a summarization maybe then, you do, then, you'll say, then you'll end with saying am i missing something or or maybe i think i'm missing something can you please help um, and then people will come in with the suggestions right and also in the sign in just you can say um uh, to end off with like um oh this is um so this case, um, for this case, I, re I, I need your help. Um, please uh, say if anything is going the wrong way, or I need uh, if you, if you if you feel like something is happening that I'm not aware of, then please tell me. Um, you have my permission, or something like that, um, because then you are creating psychological safety in the team, and that's essential. And then it's important for the team leader to be uh, like communicating uh, in a like a um, proficient way not too much uh, details um, and being clear about what they're saying um, and being calm because the calmness of the team leader will reflect like will will be uh, like uh, infectious to the entire team right so um, and also the tone and the voice and so on like the verbals and non-verbals are really important as a team leader then the team members, so the team leader and the team members create the entire team, right? So, um, what the team members need to be good at? Uh, a good team member is someone who um, is proficient at what they're about to do, right? So, and they say if they're not proficient, right? So they know the limitations and they tell the team leader when asked uh, whether they can intubate. They'll say, I can or I can't, and but but they will also be like solution. Um, minded so that they will try to find a solution to it. Oh, I, I can't do this task, but I can call my 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 senior, or I can do this, and or we or maybe we can do this instead. Um, they use what you call appropriate interruptions, right? So um, every team member has a lot of information that they may or may not need to give to the team leader. And the team leader like has a lot of uh, information coming in, and they can easily be task uh, task loaded or uh, or like cognitively loaded to a point where they cannot take in any information. Yeah. So it's really important for the team member to to have this balance between ha knowing that there's data that they need to say, but also saying it at an appropriate moment. Um, they shouldn't during the intubation uh, go and say like, oh, I, the, the IV, um, which which rate should the IV go in, like go in at um, for the C problem, right? Um, that's that's not uh, necessary information at that time, like uh, right now. So so it's also see, being a team member is not passively; it's something active, and it's about thinking steps ahead, um, uh, both for the for the um, for the entire team, but also for the area of uh, information, like area of responsibility that you have on the team. Um, um, thinking a couple of steps ahead, so that oh. Um, I don't have a, a IV here. I cannot get an IV. Maybe I'll already now. I'm, I'm getting the IO uh, kit uh, ready to drill if I need to. Um, and then it's important to like, if you're part of one of these like really big teams where you have maybe only the A or the C part of the team, then it's really important to know like when to speak up if if there's something 
that you you think that you need to know and you don't know that, then it's important to ask the team leader, wait, wait, I don't know where we are. Could we please do a summarization or a 10 in 10 as we like a, 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 a summarization of, of, of like, where are we and where are we going? Uh, or ask for what you need um, and come with suggestions for the team leader when they, they when they ask like am I missing something well uh, so I right, then like help them in their mind maps okay we, we this patient has has shock, has shock. Um, we need to think about well is it something hypovolemic is it something on the chest uh, sorry in this cardiogenic is it is it obstructive is it distributive is it uh, dissociative right so so you can kind of help the team leader in these kind of things oh i can do a pocus to take out if there's tampon out and so on so like come with suggestions and and do it in a balanced way all right and then you can do this like if the team leader is not like if you have essential information but the team leader is not listening or cannot like cannot listen right now but it's really like mission critical that they know, then you can use this graded assertiveness, right? It's kind of what you do with children as well. Um, not that I'm necessarily in other uh, areas drawing, drawing parallels, but uh, usually like st state the fir first, like I think there's something here that we need to know. That's if, like, it's, like the first step. And then next step would be may maybe like, um, you need you need to know this, like, um, uh, or, um and then like it, it goes like on to like the re very end words like like <laughs> um stop the patient is not breathing like uh, uh, if, if no one's listening then you have to escalate your your uh, assertiveness that's the graded assertiveness assertiveness a tool right and how you do that is different in different situations sometimes you need to like say stop right away if everything is like if if so you if you have information that is really time critical and no one's listening, then just stop. The patient is not breathing. That's that's uh, reasonable to say if that's the case, right? All right. Then we talk about communication a lot, and communication is like an umbrella term in non-technical skills or crew crew, crew resource management. Um, it's like an umbrella term in the, uh, that spans the entire thing. But some of the like some of the most important things to know about in, for these these courses is the closed loop system, and you probably know about this already like um i want uh, like the, the 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 one who wants something uh, states something to the to, to the person who has who's going to go do it and so it's like and then you um, then the person who's just uh, who got the order is going to repeat the order and then once the they're done it then they will then they will um go back and say that i've done it now so it might be um could you please give uh, the patient five milligrams of morphine IV um, now? And then the, the nurse or whoever's doing it might say, uh, I'll give the patient five milligrams of IV now, uh, morphine. And um, th then once they've done it, they'll do. They'll say, I've now I've, I've given the five milligrams of morphine. And then the, and the team leader can say, good. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so that's the closed loop, and, and, and certain, especially the more critical the task is, the more important it is for the closed loop to like happen. Um, then you have the SBAR, and the SBAR is is also one of these like tools that we use for sign in or sign out, or when we're consulting someone. And we usually in the course that I'm instructing, the Emergency Medicine Core Competences course. We talk about that the S is really like the most important thing, especially when we're consulting someone especially so you do the james bond s you don't say like oh i have someone with a bit of chest pain and they, they, the situation is they came in with chest pain uh, uh, and then and this happened and this happened like you know you 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 need to you need to get the attention of the um consultant right away um and you don't need to waste your time um uh, if you want them to come down right so um all right um Aortic aneurysm, um, blood in the belly, come now. That's like the James Bond is. Oh, you got my attention. All right. Um, then it's important to, like when we're communicating as well, to be, um, like in certain situations like cardiac arrest, uh, you're going to have some kind of scripts that you, that, that is going to be used uh, the same, like the, the, the same thing every time. So that might be every time, like there's a, analysis like when you when you when you're assessing the rhythm of the uh, of the of the heart um every two, two minutes during the cardiac arrest cycle 
and you'll say 30 seconds to, to analysis, 10 seconds to analysis. Is everyone ready with POCUS and so on and so forth to, to do compression free, uh, to, to, to minimize compression uh, free time? And then you'll say, all right, analysis, everybody away, or you may in America say clear, and then everyone's off the chest. And then, so, so these like you have these this kind of scripts, and this can be only a few words, or sometimes it can be like more than that. Uh, Erin Birzel has done a huge trauma script for uh, on Saint Emlyn's pod, uh, podcast and blog. If you want to check that out for trauma, um, so it's important to have these kind of like words, and we've drilled these words so we know what uh, what what we're going to say in, in some of the situations. Then we talk about situational awareness, and here come, comes this like 10 in 10, like the shared mental model, um, or we say like don't surprise the room. It's really a, like if, you do, if you're going to do a thoracotomy, then it's probably important to say to, 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 to the room or the team leader, I'm going to do a thoracotomy uh, so that you, they know that something is happening with the patient. Because if you're on the C part like you do you're assessing the c or treating the c and someone is suddenly intubating the patient or doing a thoracotomy then then maybe you maybe you you know it because you see it but oftentimes you don't because you're so um, task focused on your own thing your head's down and you kind of need to know um and that's a team there's um like role to 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 kind of let the team know um when 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 these time critical things are going on um, and also the team member who's doing them is, is like they're they should function as an autonomic unit but when it when it comes time to some some of the time critical things they should call back to the team leader and say i'm ready to do this is it okay that we do this now or should we wait or like in a closed loop kind of fashion all right we already talked about um cognitive loading and because if you like Getting all the data points and knowing, like, and getting getting information from your team members and so on. If you're loaded with tasks, uh, like, oh, I have to look this up or I have to do this, then then you then you're task loaded and you cannot get in. Then you can't get any more information in, and you need to do that, right? Um, so, so you all, as a team leader, especially, you need to deload. Um, so. Um, do something, delegate tasks, and if you really need to do something, then you have to like, give the leadership to someone else. Then it's important to this, like this call it fly ahead of the plane. So, um, for instance, if you have someone who is coming in in two minutes and they are crashing, like they're, there's two or three liters of blood um, pre-hospitally uh, from vomiting blood. Um, they have a blood, they have an unmeasurable breath, blood pressure right now. They're still awake. Then you might, as a team member, like team leader, say, "Okay, this is what we think we're going we're going to uh, going to happen. We will put in the IVs uh, as fast as we can. If that's not going to to work, then we'll do IOs, or you will do IOs. C person, you will, your only job is to do an IO. And then once that is done, then is done, you will give the blood. Okay, documentation person, you are going to do that. Uh, call for blood right now." So that we have it at the ready once the I/O is established, um, and flying ahead of the plane is, is, is can be seen as also like if this happens, what are we like? So, but this per person like who's coming in, if 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 they develop cardiac arrest, then we then. We're not going to push on the chest. We're not doing compression because this is a uh, hypotensive, uh, sorry, a bleeding, like a hypovolemic bleeding caused, uh, cause of cardiac arrest. And we're not going to pump the chest. We're going to do um, put in blood as much as possible and, and do another IO. That's what, where we're going to do our resources or place our resources. So then we have a plan and then the team is more secure. Okay, we know if this happens, then this is going to go, go down. Um, Flying ahead of the plane is also um, that is, is the team leader knowing that, okay, um, this patient has low blood pressure and we need to intubate them so that we need, then we need to resuscitate them first to be able to get uh, them intubated so that they can get to the CT scanner. Right. So, okay, we need to get to the CT scanner. Then we need to call the CT scanner. Okay. Then we, then documentation person, you can call the CT scanner right now and say that we're coming in 10 minutes or something like that. Right. So you kind of, you laying the ground, the ground, you, you, you're thinking one or two steps ahead. Um, um, 
and that takes experience to know like which kind of scenarios can unfold in front of your eyes and what's what's going on and then sharing that with the team is in a shared mental model um when appropriate when you think that your team needs to know or when you're stuck and you kind of need the the information from the team all right um a really important point here i think is uh, which i love talking about is what you call opportunity costs so opportunity cost is doing something that may be harmless in and of itself um, but in the resource bay it takes time and therefore it takes time from something that is more important um, and it could be for instance um, um, doing ch chest auscultation when you could be doing pocus um, or doing pocus when you could be doing uh, like when, when, you, when you know you're going to the CT scanner and, and getting that information anyway, then it's an opportunity cost to do the focus if it's not changing your management in any way, um, right? So um, it could also be um, if you want to give, um, if you have someone with an upper GI bleed and you want to give them tranexamic acid, uh, or, or the surgeon wants them to give PPIs and tranexamic acid, um, then uh, and then they're critically ill. Then it's not like the evidence on this is really really bad, right? They're they're almost non-existent, and for tranexamic acid, there it is existent, and it says that there's no uh, reason to give it uh, for in most cases, right? So uh, from the whole test trial, and so so you might be thinking, okay, the surgeon wants this, I need to give it, but uh, that that would be opportunity cost because you may only have one line, and you really want to use that for giving. Uh, Nexium um, or PPIs and TXA, something that you won't, won't work in this critically ill patient, or you want do you want to just give blood like that, that? That's the thing that you want to prioritize, right? So even though TXA and PPIs are probably um, um, almost harmless, and then the time that it takes and the line that they will occupy uh, when you're giving them uh, will be harmful, right? So that's the concept of opportunity cost, and it's, it's just so essential. Then we talk about is decision making and decision making. I've made several blogs and, and, and videos on, so you can check those out. Um, I don't want to give it go into too many details other than there's this concept of the cognitive biases, for instance, where um, we may um, too early in the case say that, oh, this patient has um, low blood pressure and they have a fever and they have belly pain. Okay, this, this must be something abdominal. Uh, it must be, we need to do the CT scan and then we, we maybe will treat them um, as an either hypovolemia or a sepsis. But you may not uh, consider getting all the data points for uh, like the new anchoring or premature closering uh, too early. And you may not consider that this patient has a diabetic, diabetic ketoacidosis on their venous blood gas. Um, and... So and 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 these biases are like as I talked about earlier, they're kind of a it's a balance, right? So we need our system one to do quick, um, reflexive things in the resource room, um, but once our plan is not working the way it should, or it's not really going the right way, or in in specific points of t in time during the resuscitation. Uh, we need to st take a step back and say, okay, this is what has happened right now. Um, it's not going the right way, or I just want to check up that I'm not missing anything. So then you can go fall back to the system two kind of checklist kind of way, or thinking about thinking here and and saying like, okay, shock. Um, it seems like sepsis and it seems like like hypovolemic, but um, the pH is also like really low and there's a high anion gap. Um, could it be tamponade? Could it be this could be like then you go through like more systematic way to like kind of check your thinking, and it, this is really important with someone to do that. Um, lots of lots of things to talk about in decision making as well, but let's jump over that and and then go to performance under pressure. So performance under pressure is kind of the you have probably seen this model where you have uh, your um, the your like the flow model or the flow curve i think it's you know, called the yodel something curve i can't remember the name always all the time but um what these essence essentials of that theory is that um once we there's a certain point where we 
if if we if we are too understimulated, then our then we're not doing performing too well because it's boring. Uh, and if we're overstimulating, stay overstimulated, then we're then we're too stressed to to perform. So we need that Goldilocks zone where we are appropriately engaged. Um, so, so and then we can uh, and 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 stimulated, then we can perform best. And we talk about left shifting the curve. So um, if you are too far uh, out in the stress cone, right, then you need to left shift your curve. You need to push yourself into the um, left side of the curve or, or push towards the left so that you get more uh, flow and you get more performance, um, right? And that you can do by a lot of things. And if you want to read up on performance under pressure, check out Dan Dworkis's book uh, and podcasts on the topic. Uh, I think it's called The Resuscitationist's Mind. Um, and it's really, really great. Um, also, First 10 EM, Justin Morganson has done a blog on performance under pressure. Lots of people have done that. And just th th these are just two out of a lot to, to check out that out. You can also check out, out Mike Loria, who's made great um, both podcasts and articles on this. All right, so so these are some of the non-technical skills. Sorry, and, and, and some some ways of left shifting your, left shifting your curve that might be to cotton deload. Um, you may um, do some personal things like breathing techniques, or and you meet like before the case. You you, you want to be visualizing so visualizing some of the cases like what you what Martin Brownlee calls armchair flying, where you like sit down in a chair and 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 kind of use your brain to visualize these cases and what you would do in them and check out Dan Dworkis's lectures on this to get like a deep dive into how to do this and how to because it's hugely important that we as emergency physicians do this so this is all of these are, are really important skills to have and there's much more to talk about here but that's just like some of the things that really are important especially also for the course where um, but especially for reality as well all right so now we talked about like the some of the basic concepts now we'll kind of talk about the first frame here so what are we going to do uh, in real life and in the course when we when we get the brief um we're going to do what do you call a sign in with the team or a pre brief and the and the so the the main reason for the pre brief is that um, we want to um, the ambulance is coming and we want to uh, not stand stand on our feet we want to be up in speed uh, and running uh, and knowing what to do right when the patient comes in because then the patient can get the get the best uh, treatment available right so it's like a relay race like here so how do we do that well um, cliff reed has done this amazing uh, concept and developed it over time called the step up method or the or, or just for the sign in it's just the ste this is the self the team the environment um and then you could use the p as well for the patient and the s bar which you're going to share with the, with the team um so the self is like both uh, and you can you can check out his his video I'll, I'll link to it right away here um but uh, just going through it really quickly the self is are you ready as a person like physically uh, am i fatigued and uh, have i have i um, been peeing have i eaten have i pushed away all the patients that are not in resource right now so that someone else is taking care of them so i'm not cognitively loaded or stressed about that um and so on and so forth right um the team the, m the most important thing here is you want to delegate the task you, you want to delegate roles or allocate roles as a team leader say um okay um we're getting are, are you appropriate with or are you um um comfortable with taking the uh, airway uh, and if we need if we if we need to can are you comfortable with doing uh intubation uh, maneuvers and then the person may say yes or no and if they say no then okay how do we get that person here now then if we think we need it so this is the part of the, this is the t is like kind of assessing which people do i have which people do i need and what kind of tasks do i need to have on a team before the patient comes uh, that we need to do right and then once you've done the team then they may go and prepare uh, once they're done for for the for the first kind of couple of minutes um when the when the when it's here here's the video if you want to check it out it's really really great and there's also an article on this 
the new the new the environment is is really important as well and sometimes it's called equipment as well so of course you want to crowd control the environment but also you want to check the equipment so that it's working um, and for instance if you have someone ceasing coming in you want to already now be thinking of oh if they've already gotten their two doses of midazolam or likewise benzo or like uh, like like um, similar benzodiazepines then you want them to already now draw up Cupra or uh, liver teracetam or if you have someone who is um, who is uh, dyspneic and you know that they have a heart failure in the background uh, or some other causes then you then you will probably going to need an IV or BiPAP um, and you need to have a team member who can do that like set that up and you like you need the BiPAP machine as well the equipment and so you, you might as well get all these things ready when you're doing the sign in right so that's part of what that's the STE and then the P is for the patient right and um, it's, it's all like for Cliff Reed is usually about what kind of patient do we have, but uh, is but here you can use the sign in as in an S bar fashion as we use in the EMCC course. Like I always think, like there is an overlap between the STE and the S bar way of doing the sign in. But what I think is important here is that when you've done the STE or um, some of the points in the STE, you will then share with the team. Okay, we are, we are have a uh, four-year-old who's coming in with uh, trauma to the like with a knife to the chest. Um, uh, which potential diagnosis do we think of? Well, we think of this, this may be tamponade, this may be hypovolemia. We need and from each of these differential diagnoses that are likely, we need to get things go, going right. Okay, we need to call the blood bank right now to say that this is coming in. We need to do this, do this, and do this. All right. And then um, the potential measures also in like for for just what is going what we're going to do in the first couple of minutes. That's this is where we talk to tell the team C person you need to put on in the IO right away, um, and so on and so forth. Right, the role and then and then um, so so you kind of get like in this you get the story and you kind of get what you're going to do in the first couple of minutes and then you do the update right the ten and ten after a while. Um, uh, or after an appropriate amount of time, uh, you'll do like that. Doesn't have to be 10 minutes where you'll do a summary after that. Sometimes it's two minutes because it's a really, really like a lot of a lot of things that are going on in the beginning of the of the case, um, and you need to update the team on it. Or sometimes it's you, uh, you can you can spread that time out and, and make it 20 minutes or 15 minutes depending on how far, how long time you're going to be in there. Um, but um, depends on the case, right, and the acuity of the case. Okay, so as part of the sign-in, we need to kind of know in children uh, what kind of doses we're going to give. And um, usually this is part of the sign-in where we are either write on a blackboard or a whiteboard um, what, the, um, what the weight of the patient is. And then maybe you have a computer system doing this or maybe you don't. Um, if you uh, like calculating the doses of the most common drugs given in the critically ill child. And... In the ePELTS course, you will not get um, any help at the uh, like the exam cases where, where you where you're getting, getting evaluated and whether or not you can be certified. You will not have the help of um, either any iPhone apps or um, you will not have the written out wet bag. You will need to calculate these things by yourself, right? So um, it's important to know this slide if you're doing doing the ePELTS course, especially some of the drugs um, over here are important. So I'll just give you, uh, also for life, I'll give you a way to calculate these and, and some of the things I think are, think are in essential when, um, when doing this. So first of all, uh, there's lots of different weight-based weight, weight based, um, rules here. This is just one of them, and this is the one that ePALS um, suggests that we use. It's The weight is the, the child's year, like age in years, plus four times two. Um, and this is this works for uh, children of one year of age and above. And if, if you if you have someone who's maybe half a year, then you'll just maybe like then you'll guesstimate it like oh, one year is ten kilos and half a year must be around five kilos or something like that. Um, if you have someone who maybe who maybe is seven years old, then the weight would 
uh, be estimated to 7 plus 4, that, that's, uh, that's 11, and times 2, that's 22. All right. And from that, you're going to be able to calculate a whole lot. So uh, this is where you have the, the wet back. So the, the, the W in the wet back is, is the W, right? And then you have the E, which is energy. Energy for cardiac arrest would be four joules per kilo. So in, your, in the example of a, of a 22 kilo child, this would be um, four times 22, which is 88, right? So, and this can go up to six cool joules per kilo if it's refractory. Then uh, also for energy, you will have the SVT, which is um, compensated or decompensated. And if it's a, if it's a compensated, meaning that uh, sorry, if it's decompensated, mean that meaning that the patient may not be mentating it as well, or they are having signs of cardiogenic shock, um, then you'll give them a synchronized, importantly synchronized, as opposed to the cardio like the cardiac arrest, uh, non-synchronized uh, defibrillation. This is synchronized uh, defibrillation, uh, where you push the synchronized button so that the shock is coming on the T wave. And, and here it's one joule, and then two joules, and then four joules per kilo. And you'll see this like first one, then double the dose, and then double the dose of that in several cases, also in adenosine when you're giving that. All right. Um, then the tube, the size of the uh, endotracheal tube is the year, like, so that's, a, that's a, like the four rule. So it's like, se like, for instance, seven years of age divided by four plus four. So that's around around 2 plus 4, that may be a, maybe a 6, around 5.56-ish. All right. And always, when it comes to tubes and LMAs and so on, always take a size above or half a size above and half a size below. Because these are, these are like rules or guesstimations. It's not the exact thing, right? Then for fluid boluses, then you have your, like for, for if you have someone in shock, then you'll bolus their, uh, for, if you have something in hypovolemic shock, you'll give 10 milliliters, 10 milliliters uh, of um, fluid per kilo, whether that's blood or crystalloids. That means for our um, 22 kilo child, that would be 220 milliliters in a bolus. And uh, for sepsis, you'll, you may be giving 60 milliliters per kilo up to maybe up to 100 milliliters per kilo the first hour, according to the EPALS. Um, and then you may be, if they're, if they're responding, that's good. But if they're not responding, then you will not give all this fluid. You will uh, go on to give them noradrenaline or adrenaline or some other vas vasopressive stuff, um, stuff right? Um, and you may remember that the the circulating volume of a child is 80 milliliters, 80 milliliters per kilo. So at this point, there will be more, almost more water than the child. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is important. If the patient is bleeding, then the max dose uh, of crystalloids is 20 milliliters per kilo, meaning for our child is 440 milliliters. And then uh, if you have a what you call a massive transfusion protocol, then you will step away from giving just 10 milliliters of fluid or of blood, then you'll give 10, 10, 5, meaning that you'll give 10 uh, milliliters per kilo of red blood cells, and then 10 milliliters uh, per kilo of plasma, and then 5 milliliters per kilo of uh, um, thrombocytes. Check out the first 10 EM um, deep dive on uh, massive transfusion protocols, because the evidence is not as strong as we might have thought on this. Um, and then you can give a training acid, uh, 20, milliliters, 20 milligrams per kilo within the first hour in trauma. Um, and there is this rule of thumb as well, while, while we add this uh, area, that if, if you've given, according to the EPALS course, if you've given 40 milliliters per kilo uh, of blood uh, to a patient, meaning that you're given four boluses and they're not improving or they're not, they're still not like they're still they're maybe stable but not improving or they're worsening. Despite of that, then you then that's a cue to go to the OR instead of doing going to the CT scan. All right, then we come to one of these things that even me as a um, uh, adult physician, <laughs> emergency physician should should know by heart because sometimes we do get children in uh, to our central uh, hospital in Stockholm, uh, for instance, for with anaphylaxis, which we have had not that too long ago. So we need to know that the dose for children in either cardiac arrest or anaphylaxis is 0 0.01 milligrams per kilo. Okay. 
So that's the dose. So in cardiac arrest and in anaphylaxis, the dose is the same. We give the same amount of adrenaline, but it's the solution uh, that is different. And that's different from adults, right? So in adults, you give 0 0.5 milligram, uh, milligrams intramuscularly, and you, you give one milligram intravenously. So, uh, But for children, it's the same dose, but it's just different um, uh, different solutions because intramuscularly, you don't want to give a lot of volume because it hurts uh, giving that intramuscularly. <laughs> and and for cardiac arrest, you want to have a push dose, right? You want to have something, solution, a solution to like push that. Um, adrenaline around the system um, when you're giving it. So you, so 0 0.01 milligrams per kilo. Um, if you want, uh, for our patient, that, that that's 0 0.22 um, milligrams. And if you want to um, quickly calculate that, the, the, the quick route of doing that would be um, how many milliliters are you going to tell the, um, tell the um, nurse that we're going to give and for the um, for the um, uh, intramuscular, then you the, the the rule of thumb is that so 22 kilos, then you'll divide that by 100, and then then you'll get the um, intramuscular dose. So you 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 write 22, and you move the comma from here to one, uh, sorry from here, and then one two, and then you'll have 0 0.22 you'll give 0 0.22 milliliters of one milligram per milliliter intramuscularly. Um, that's not a lot, right? That's, that's a tiny amount. <laughs> you, you get one milliliter syringe and then you draw up 0 0.2 milliliters, right? For the cardiac rest dose, um, if you have a cardiac arrest on this seven year old, 22 kilo child, then you'll just move the comma one time. So that will be 2.2 milliliters of 0 0.1 milligram per milliliter. And you need to drill this, kind of, you need to tell, like drill this so that you know what to say to the nurses because they don't may, may not know and they're in the stressful situation, then you can tell them out saying how many milliliters do you need to give. All right, and then I put in the Amax 4 dose here. I think it's important. I think we should know that by heart as well. Um, this is a like this is a tenth of the dose um, for um, IM and IV, and the Amax4 algorithm. I'll, I'm linking to that in an, in a, one of the other um, slides. But in short, um, if you have someone who's cra a crashing asthmatic patient or a crashing anaphylactic patient, meaning that they you, they have asthmatic symptoms with with or without anaphylaxis, and they are becoming unconscious, then at the point when they're coming, becoming unconscious, you will um, give, um, within four minutes, you will give IV adrenaline, because IM adrenaline will not work in time here. The IM, IM adrenaline, adrenaline has a, um, um, a uh, time to effect for around, about around eight minutes if it's intramuscularly, and it's, I think it's around up to 20 minutes if it's sub-Q, subcutaneously. So that is not enough time to save the brain if they are becoming unconscious and they don't have any cyclating um, oxygen in their, in their blood. So that's why you're giving this dose. So... Um, and the, the, the easiest way to draw this is um, drawing it from, so this is a, if you take this solution and you, and then you dilute it um, once, and then you take a one milliliter syringe and draw up um, one milliliter of 0 0.1 uh, milligram per milliliter, and then, and then this, that's usually in the solution of 10 milliliters, right? So um, one milliliter of that would be 0 0.01 milligrams per milliliter. And if you draw that up in a one milliliter syringe, then you can give, like for our child, you will have to give 2.2 uh, milligrams per milliliter. Then you can give, um, um, uh, you can give these like, uh, 0 0.2 milliliters um, um, of, of the one milliliter syringe um, from this solution, from the one, uh, 0 0.1 milligram per milliliter solution. Please check out the AMAX4 um, homepage to see how they're drawing it up as well, because then you can um, kind of see it there as well. All right, for, for glucose, um, if you have an IV, then you'll give three milliliters per kilo. 
meaning of 10% glucose, and then you'll take a new um, blood glucose in 10 minutes. Uh, and you may use a maintenance dose of 6, six to 8 milligrams per kilo per minute. Um, and if you don't have an uh, IV, then you may either, either have glucose, uh, sorry, honey, uh, that you can give in, in the, the, the cheek, inside the cheek, the buccally. Or you may give IM glucagon, which is 1 milligram over 25 kilos, child. And then there's a, it's 0.5 um, milligrams if it's a smaller child uh, under uh, 25 kilos or you may give it intranasally which i have never done though <laughs> be aware of glucagon it, it may induce vomiting in at least i think it's like 25 percent of people um so for our 22 kilo child here it would be um, 66 milliliters right uh, that we have to give um, as a bolus then seizures as the last one here. You will get midazolam, 0.1 milligram per kilo, IV, which would be 2.2 um, uh, milligrams intravenously for our um, patient. Um, and then you'll the next dose would be, uh, oh, sorry, if it's intramuscularly, then you'll give the double dose. And, and if it's uh, internasally or buccally, then you'll get the triple dose. All right, then there's, um, if we talk about energy here, there's a few nuances here uh, and a few more drugs I want to tell you about outside of the wet bag. So um, for defibrillation, it's important to know, or it's, it's the, the course wants you to know that um, if you have a smaller child, again, under um, 25 kilos, then you want to use a child um, AED if it's available. If not, if it's not available, then you just use the adult AED. Um, and you always go up to um, the next level, so to speak. So if you have, for our child, it's 88 uh, joules, and if your model only goes up to 100 or 150 and 200, then you go up to the next level that is closest to the 88 joules, but not below it. So you will not go down to maybe 50, you will go up to 100 joules. All right. All right. And you have a few other essential drugs here. Amiodarone, because like for the course, they want you to know by heart the amiodarone. They want you to know fluid boluses, um, just that one. They want you to know um, the, the jewel. Uh, oh, sorry, not the jewel. Um, yeah, well, I guess the jewel they, they want you to know. They want you to know adenosine doses. They want you to know adrenaline and the glucose and also midazolam. And amiodarone is one of those as well. So you'll give five milligrams per kilo, meaning for our patient here, that would be 110 uh, milligrams for the first dose. And then for the second dose, it will be 110 again, because that's still under. And so maximally the first time it will give, get, you'll give uh, the adult maximal dose 300 milligrams, right? But 110 is way below that, so it's all right. And then for the second dose, you'll give 100 and 50 and that's also way below sorry you'll get 110 again and that's also way below 150. Um, amiodarone is of course given at the third shockable rhythm in a row um, or the third shockable rhythm in the cardiac arrest uh, doesn't have to be in a row but the third one and then uh, on the fifth one as well this, this is where you get the half dose if, uh, or maximally the half dose but in this case they're both below the max dose so they'll just give the same dose then i think it's important to know the kepra dose or this one just one second line uh, drug um, so kepra is one of them and note that the max dose is controversial in different uh, guidelines then calcium gluconate is important as well, uh, atropine. And for pain indication, it's really, really important. For instance, paracetamol, NSAIDs, and fentanyl intranasally. These are really, really important drugs to know, maybe even ketamine or cataprosane. But uh, something that is not needed in this course, and therefore I'm not going through it. But please check out, if you're Swedish or Danish, then you can check out uh, the pain lecture that I linked, linked to in the beginning. All right, and here's just some details about hypokalemia and how to treat that uh, in detail as well. Sorry, hyperkalemia. All right, that's if you wanted to calculate in your head. And I'm, I'm not receiving any money from uh, Lisa Hospital in Denmark, but I might be biased, but I think, I, because I think this is the best app 
and I've I've seen several apps for this, like the child doses, so dosages. This is the best app I think for critically ill children, where you need to know the doses doses really fast. So you just roll the wheel, then you'll get the kilo um, according to the years of age, and then you'll once you push OK, then you get this picture. Um, and then you'll get all the doses right away. And just for the ePALS course, be aware that the, like this, like the vital, per, vital parameters reference range is a bit different than what they want you to know. So um, it's still like, it's still good, um, but it's just a bit different. Um, a few, maybe five off sometimes or 10 off sometimes. All right, and I, then the last thing I'm going to say is I encourage you to, to buy this, uh, or I think it's free right now as well, and, but, and, but get the Danish version if you're a Scandinavian, because then you'll have another uh, marker here, and if you push that, then you get all the emergency conditions that, that, is, that are out there for children that are relevant, and you get all the doses for it. So if I wanted to check out what's the prednisone dose for, uh, for a croup, then, then you can find that here as well. All right, last point I want to give you, get to you in the sign-in. So we talked about the STE and SBAR. We talked about the Copy app or uh, wet bag doses so that we know um, what kind of doses, to, what kind of medication to give and what doses. Then I also uh, lastly want to, to bring to you this, like you have, you have some, you, it's really good to have someone on the blackboard, whiteboard, writing up this stuff. So you write the wet bags. You, if you have trauma you want, you, and you want to give blood or anything else, like other products, you write this up because then you can keep track of um, how much you've given. Um, and someone coming into the room knows right away, okay, we've given this much and this much and this much. And, and for some, there's a rule of thumb, like every th third or fourth um, RPC you're giving, then you'll give one bolus, bolus of calcium. You can check out uh, the... Uh, ICU EDU by Sarah Krager. Her homepage is great, and they, they are going through a lot of these concepts as well. And then for cardiac arrest, same thing. Someone who takes the time uh, and tells when it's, how, how like low flow, how much low flow time you've had, or how much how, how like how far is it since that you 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 uh, had the cardiac arrest, right? Then you check cycles and amount of defibs and no amount of no defibs and adrenaline given and amiodarone given and so on. So you have some kind of overview here. So yeah, important to have someone to keep track of this. So. When the patient comes in, before we're monitoring anything, especially, um, yeah, then then we're going through this kind of um, quick look gestalt kind of thing. And in the in the ePALS, we are talking about three Bs, and I think it's from the APLS, the uh, the um, pediatric assessment triangle, where we are talking about appearance, work of breathing, and circulation. It's the same thing. So what they call appearance is the same as behavior. What they call work of breathing is the same as breathing. And what they call circulation is what they call body color here. And um, it's what we can do with our like eyes and ears and, and, and maybe hands and before monitoring is putting, being put on. All right, so this is just the five really quick five seconds. And in the, in the course, they want you to just, um, in the ePALS course, they want you to check, okay, behavior, is the, how, how is the patient acting? Is, uh, and like to go a little bit deeper here is just either, like a normal child will be either, like this is a new situation coming into the emergency, emergency room, they will always be attentive. They may be scared. Um, and that's relevant, but they, but they will always, be, they may be, um, they may be curious or they may be looking around, but if they're not interested and, or, or if they're irritable, like inconsolable, uh, even after a few minutes or, uh, then, then, then that's a problem, right? And that, that's something that's of concern, especially if they're not like at all taking like, if they're just 
staring blankly or if they're not even closing your eyes and they're somnolent uh, then that's a really bad sign right or if they have a weak, weak cry they're really like trying to cry but not, they can't really because they're too weak that's also a problem so here we see like normal behavior or not normal behavior and that's one of like the big sensitive flags if they're if they're not behaving normally then that's that's one of the really big ones that we want to pick up this is a sick child even though we don't know whether or not they are and why they are sick they maybe they are really sick now right so we want to check that's a big really important thing to look at then is breathing seeing if they have interactions what their worker breathing is like worker breathing breathing as we'll come back to is looking at the stomach or is there abdominal breathing is there um, is the thorax uh, is there excursions uh, are they doing accessory muscles in the neck like tracheal tuck or sternocleidomastoideus, or are they using um, the nose like really small children, or are they head bobbing? Um, um, and when I'm saying using a nose, I'm saying is there a nasal flare? So, and we made it, may as well just say it here that um, <coughs> this work of breathing is, of course, important as. Um, um, but it's like if you have someone with excursions like, or retractions in if, if they are older like the older the child is the more ossified the thorax becomes and the less soft they become if you have a child that is not soft um, but they still have excursions um, or in, in, like um, retractions when they're breathing then that's a really bad sign Whereas with a small child, of course, it is you don't want them to be having excursions, but it's not as bad a sign if everyone else, everything else is looking quite quite okay. Um, and with all of these signs with children, children is really is really hard. There's no one sensitive test in them. You need to take the entire picture, and that's why the ABCs are a bit wider than they would be for adults. They're a bit more like there are more things to do. All right, so that's that. Um, abnormal breath breathing sounds that might be strider um, as, as uh, inspiratory strider right as so that's an upper airway problem uh, in the croup or in epiglottitis or whatever something is closing the airway um, it may be um, wheezing like exp like or um, ex like prolonged expiratory phase with asthma or anaphylaxis it may be um, it may be grunting like uh, like where they're auto CPAPing their own like lips, like COPD patients sometimes do, and that may that's just a that's a unspecific sign, but it, it's it's a sign that for badness if they're doing that, especially the smaller children. This might be um, this may be pneumonia, maybe maybe something else. Um, all right, and body color uh, are they pale? Are they cyanotic? Are they mottled? And mottled is also one of these like decompensated shock kind of badness things if they're muddled uh, again any of these signs are not necessarily um, worrisome in isolation but we're already when becoming picking up these data points so what do we do with this information well um, if they have if they are positive in any of the three B's then we will um, then we will um, uh, tell that to the team and when we're doing the next part which is which are the three s's then we may be calling for more help uh, right away because we see this is a sick child we need more hands on deck all right um then in trauma i just wanted to tell you that there's a in the epals they want you to look for something else they want you to look for um three um they want you to look for tension tension pneumothorax they want you to look for like or obvious tense in pneumothorax that would mean that means uh, on e like asymmetric chest rise um you want you to look for c a b c d like so you want to look for major hemorrhage that can be stopped right away and you want to, they, they want you to look for uh, are they breathing or not breathing meaning are they in cardiac arrest and that's the three things here and the same thing here if they're not breathing then you're looking then you're checking for look see look see and feel and if they're not if they're if they are um, not breathing uh, and they are unconscious then that's a cardiac arrest right you don't check for pulses okay um and just if you're also like me are going to going to do the european trauma course then you have something similar called the five second round and the five second round that's where you 
are um, checking for kind of the, the, it's the behavior of the patient, it's the breathing of the patient, it's the body color of the patient, or the pulses and the perfusion of the patient. So it's very much the same kind of thing. Um, in trauma, of course, it's like the are there any big C problems? Are there any big uh, breathing problems? Are there any cardiac arrest? Uh, or are there any big A problems? And yeah, that's kind of the same thing. And then you're depending on whether there are problems or not, then you're delegating that task to the patient, to, to the A person. Like, okay, there's an A problem. Then you take the report as the um, as the team leader, and then you'll just delegate the um, taking, uh, like the, the managing of the A to the A person. And then they have to be caught up to speed, uh, speed afterwards. Um, if you have something that is quickly fixable, like a seizure, um, or potentially quickly fixable, then you just put in put in uh, IOs or IVs, and then give the medication, and then go on with the report while you yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes you and this is where like you need to step out of the ABC algorithm, or you need to before going into it, you have to do this right. Okay. And just to show, like, this is something that we um, also do in the EMCC course. We have this kind of this danger thing up here. And the danger thing um, also is, this, like, you have the three Bs, and then you do the three Ss. So once you've done the three Bs, then you have the three Ss, which is shout for help, like support in the EMCC. You do safety. Is this safe? Like, especially pre hospitally is this a safe area? Or are they safety? And you may... Like I thought this, it, it sounds good with the three S's, but I really like this to be in the pre-brief. Like we put on safety goggles and so on before the patient arrives and we kind of shout for help already before, but also we can think about it when the patient arrives. Oh, they look worse than we thought. And then the last one is the, 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 S, the last S is to stimulate the patient. And I, yeah, well, I think already when they're breathing, then you want to stimulate the patient because if you're not stimulating the patient at that point, then you don't know whether or not they're cardiac arrest, right? So you need, always need to stimulate the patient if you're in the cardiac arrest part, but you don't need to do it twice, right? In the Bs and, the, and then here. But yeah. So you do the three Bs. Um, are they breathing? Are they uh, what is the body color and how is it, how is the behavior? And then you do the three S's. Oh, I, I they look bad. I want to shout for help. We need more help here. We need an anesthesiologist. We need an A person, and we or or something else, right? And we're putting on our glasses and gloves, um, and then we're we're stimulating. We're touching the patient. Is are they all right? Okay. Then we move on to the next part, which is. Uh, let's say uh, let's say that they are in cardiac arrest, and let's go through these cardiac arrest things that the ERC, like the EPELS and the ERC guidelines, are closely related, right? They're, they're the same group that do these. They, they, like the EPELS is the course um, where the ERC guidelines are kind of is kind of the like the background knowledge, uh, um, and then made into a book. All right, so. Pediatric um, cardiac arrest. So, adult cardiac like well, how how do we diagnose it? Well, adult cardiac arrest is someone who's unresponsive, right, and is uh, and has abnormal breathing. That doesn't mean that they like we we count agonal breathing and so on here as well. And then you do cardiac arrest, and then you go into the cardiac arrest mode, um, and you shout, "This is a cardiac arrest!" And then you do all the things that you do, right. Um, in the child, it's the same thing, unresponsive or abnormal breaths. But the, the main difference, there's one difference here, and this is mainly in hospitals because you don't want to be full, like more and more evidence is coming out that we cannot fall, like we cannot um, uh, feel pulses in a, in a like um, secure or reliable way. So we want to do focus pulses or we don't want to do pulses at all. Um, at least not for the diagnostic of a cardiac arrest. Maybe for Rusk we may do manual pulses, but that's another thing. But for children, if we are in a, um, if they if they are unconscious and they have a like, and we we have a monitor that says that they are bradycardic, like under sixty, then that is a cardiac arrest scenario. It's not a cardiac arrest scenario if they have primary bradycardia. That's really rare in children. But if they have secondary um, bradycardia, like secondary to hypoxia or something else, uh, meaning that they're unresponsive and they have this, 
then then there's a cardiac arrest and then you have to um then you then you go do the algorithm right then the courses we'll go through them in a little while but that's the for for adults is usually mixed right but the main reason for the difference in in the algorithm is because most of the children will have hypoxic or hypovolemic or a combination of both for, for as a reason of, of this almost 90 percent will have that so the algorithm for children will be focusing much more on um and especially in the neonatal guideline as well but like deliver, delivering breaths is really important because that may kick this kick the heart like <laughs> make, make the heart start again or make them perfuse again um, and that's why there, there's a higher um, focus on that in, in the pediatric one, but in the adult one, it's mixed, and and that, that's why it's it's not as prioritized as uh, as in the other one. Um, then for the compressions, um, what do we do there? Well, we do um, just kind of the same in the adults and, and children. Same recommendation: one third of the chest depth. Um, in children, you should push harder than you think. You don't want to push on children, of course, but in the Canadians, uh, like the EM Cases podcast, they say that one of the best things that they that the pediatric teams t- taught the emergency care providers was that they need to press hard, harder than you think, even though it's uncomfortable. The frequency is the same as the yeah, adults, like 100 and 100 to 120, that's staying alive again. Uh, in the lower half of the sternum and uh, around like between the nipples, uh, for really small children, you place your hands uh, like in a double thumb grip uh, for bigger children you can do with two fingers or you can do one hand um, and if you do one hand then it's easy to like or si- somewhat easy to use one hand for your compressions and then the other hand you can u- use for back belt masking so that you can um, you can be only two persons doing ventilations and a double hand grip um for the um the masks for a tight sealing the mask the vents of the back bell mask so or you can just do as an adult if it's a bigger child then you can use two hands okay uh, for compressions um especially also important don't like when you're doing the compressions then keep your hands on the chest because then you can feel whether there's chest rise or not when you're having your, t- your hands on the chest so that's, an, that's a good like small pearl um, but but don't press on the chest during the compressions. You need to recoil all the way, right? You need to um, you need to um, every time you push down, you need to go all the way up, um, but not not to let go um, of of the of the skin. But um, there should be no um, uh, the the heart should not be compressed um, during the release phase, right? Okay. Um, and then you switch every uh, maximally every two minutes. It's really hard to do this in an effective way. Uh, so maybe one and a half minutes, maybe even less sometimes. Um, you do to begin with, um, and that, then you do um, th- once you have someone who you who you who is unconscious and um, uh, with a normal breathing. Uh, you do, f- or or in a hospital setting, you have a heart rate of under 60 and un- unresponsive. And then you give, um, then you give uh, five, um, five um, rescue breaths, as it's called, um, and um, in the you will. Rescue breath is just normal ventilations, kind of. There, there might be some nuances, but according to the instructors of the EPELS course, it's just it's not special ventilations like that. It's just maybe one second breaths. So you give these breaths, and you want to be, make sure that there's chest rise. That's the most important thing. And I think in the guidelines it says chest, like like breath, or ventilation attempts, not so, so meaning that you have five attempts and then it's done. But I think the, our instructors were more like, oh, well, you, you can adjust something in the beginning just to make sure that they, because that's what you do with smaller children, like neonates. It's so important that they get this oxygen in. So uh, unless it's impossible or really hard, then you, and you try to just adjust some things if you're not getting chest rise. And you just do it until you get chest rise, not more. You don't want to hyperinflate the chest. Okay, so what you do is you do five 
rescue breaths, um, and then you then then you reanalyze, then you like remove the remove the back valve mask and see other signs of life. If there's no signs of life still, then you go into the cardiac arrest 15-2. But if there are signs of life, um, then you will kind of uh, if there are signs of life like 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 their heart rate is going up or they are like they're becoming less unresponsive, then you just keep ventilating. Um, and at a rate of, and that's kind of, um, in adults it's like 10 to 12, they usually say, like at once every six seconds. Mm, in really small children during cardiac arrest where you have intubated them, it's 20 to 25. So somewhere in between that, depending on the age, right? Um, but if there are no signs of life, then you go into the 15-2, meaning that you do 15 compressions and then two inhalations. Um, and then you do analysis every two minutes, right? And you, as, as we said, there's different ways of doing the compressions. You can be two persons doing the compressions. Uh, then you have one, you can do like one person does one handed compressions, holding and holding the back with the other hand. And then one person is doing bimanual, um, uh, ventilation mask, um, tight sealing. Or it can be three persons where one is on the chest, one is bimanually uh, doing it, uh, like doing the tight seal, and one is on the back. And when the one on the back can then be um, also looking at the chest for chest rise. And then intubation is not prioritized, even though we said just before, like hypoxemia is a, 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 um, uh, the most common course, a cause of, 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 of cardiac arrest in children. It's not prioritized. It's not overly prioritized to intubate them, though, um, which to my my ears sounds a little bit strange. But, but I think it's on balance. I think it's for just keeping the, keeping uh, uh, the algorithms all similar, um, and it, probably there's not a lot of evidence on it either. So, um, and we'll come back to special circumstances where I think it's important, more important to intubate than than in in, in the generic case. Okay. Um, so for drugs, um, well, <laughs> adults, you kind of know, I'm sure. So just check out the normal sources, ERC for that. Uh, if you want to know more on adrenaline, for instance, you can check this out, whether or not it's what, the evidence on adrenaline is becoming more and more complex, right? It, it, it you, you get more neurological, in, uh, like you get more survivors, but they're not neurological intact. And in this lecture, um, they will, they will, um, recommend that we give some doses, but not like unlimited doses, like after maybe three or four doses, and it's probably not working anymore. And then whatever effect that might have been, it's not important to give it anymore because you're just developing, you're just giving more non shockable rhythms. Um, sorry, you're giving more um, um, survivors, but not, not uh, with, with uh, neurological uh, bad outcomes. All right, so um, how do you give drugs? So I like in, 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 I usually when I teach cardiac arrest to our students and everyone else is, I usually say cardiac arrest is easy. There are only three things you need to do. You need to, one, or you need to, when you, once you've diagnosed it, and that can sometimes be hard, but diagnosing it, and then once you diagnose it, then you compress on the chest and call for help and all those things. But one, compressions, that's the most important thing, and we need to limit compression-free time and so on. Then the second uh, most important thing is defib, defibrillation, because sometimes it's reversible by defib, so that takes uh, priority. And then the third point is reversible courses, and that's where you take up your list, five, four H's and four T's, and go through you know, systematically. That's not that hard. That's not a hard algorithm to follow. And then you might, if you are really advanced and you may consider ECMO and you may, may consider end of life. These are the three points that I have here. The point, the, the problem is usually that's the non-technical skills and how to get the routine running. And we just talked about that. So I won't go into details about that. But the same things applies to cardiac arrest. What is not part of my list is the medication because I, from my understanding of the evidence, this is really something that is not high up there. It's not prioritized. So whether you give adrenaline right at the point where you need to, 
that's not important. It's it's opportunity to, for me. It's opportunity cost. A lot of this. The first couple of doses are important, maybe, or more important than the than the next following doses, right? It's like the law of diminishing returns with these things. So, yes, you have to drop the drugs. Yes, you sh we 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 will give it, but there's a lot of resources going to something that is probably not going to help. Uh, pulling up drugs, knowing the doses, knowing like pulling out the right drugs, and taking it, giving an IO or give it, giving an IV, right? This takes time and this takes resources, and oftentimes that's not prioritized at all, right? And for the generic case, it probably doesn't help. For most of the specific cases, it doesn't it doesn't help at all, like traumatic cardiac arrest, right? So, so I always encourage people to, yeah, it's something that we kind of need to know because it says in the guidelines, and yes, there might be some benefit for a few patients, but but maybe not, <laughs> and. Um, of course, we'll give it, but think of these things first. The, if, if, if this is doing, making it more complex for you, forget about it first. Do this. This is important. This is not important. Or not as important at all. So it's, it's good to know what is important and what is not important here. Okay, so adrenaline. You give it with the, from the non... The, the, if it's a non shockable rhythm, you give it from the first dose, uh, from the first non shockable rhythm, and then every second cycle right and um or every third to five minutes because that's the kind of the time for of effect of a bolus dose like that um yeah and you give it in children is it's um zero point zero one milligrams per, per kilo as we just said right um, meaning that um you move the comma um just one spot so if it's a 22 kilo guy, child is it's 2.2 milliliters of 0.1 milligram per milliliter uh, adrenaline. If it's a 77, uh, oh maybe ah, that's maybe a big child, <laughs> but if it's a um, let's say a five kilo child, then you move the comma just once, so it's 0.5 milligrams per milliliter of uh, IV. Um, uh, sorry, it's, it's 0.5 milliliters of 0.1 milligrams per milliliter. All right, so it's half a milliliter. That's not not that's not much. <laughs> so so um, we need to know that by heart, right, when we're giving it, because the nurse may be uncomfortable with it, depending on where it happens. So we give that every 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 third um, or every third to five minutes um, from from the non shock burden and just onwards from that. And that's where we may be saying maybe not onwards unlimited <laughs> but maybe a couple of doses at least right. um amiodarone uh, is something that comes in when you have what you call refractory ventricular fibrillation meaning that's defined as three shocks has not make made rosk so um yeah and what, what you and we just in the wet back um, part of this lecture we just went through how to give it uh, it's important to know how to mix it as well and um, i actually don't know that by heart but i think it's something about that you give it you have to mix it in glucose and I, it comes in a, I, maybe i think you if it's three mil, milligrams per milliliter or something like that then, then you then you um then you take the amount of milliliters of amiodarone and then you mix it with um as much uh, glucose. So if, if it was three milliliters, then it's three milliliters of amiodarone, and then it's three milliliters of glucose. So it becomes a six milliliter bolus. And you bolus it only when it's cardiac arrest, otherwise you'll give it in an, as an infusion or 20 minutes. And that you give with the third struggle rhythm and the fifth struggle rhythm. And we will talk about the new advances in refractory VF, which doesn't apply to children, but I mean it's worth trying. I, I think if you're in, like when when you're on the third shuttle rhythm, it doesn't help. Then you you have to th change something, right? But we talked about why like compressions are so important because every time we have compression free time, we we have we have to ramp that up the compressions again. It takes time. Uh, studies have shown so we really really want to decrease the amount of time that we're not compressing the chest. Okay, so how do we do that? We um, record, if we want to do POCUS, then we record it in a loop, and we don't analyze while we're recording. We just record, and then we do it. Um, so 
and we right so like 20 or 30 seconds before the team leader will say okay now it's 30 seconds to to an analysis or uh so we checking the checking the um checking the um the rhythm strip um and i want the one the guy on focus i want you to be ready to uh, to do a loop on the of the heart i want or whatever what you do, what you want to loop on or maybe that is a chest for pneumothorax and so on um i want hands on pulses already now on the quadratic and on the femoral pulses i want a um i want if the anesthesiologists are doing intubation this is your time and we want you to do it in five to ten seconds if that's not possible then i the first time here i want to use it back out then maybe next time we we may prioritize to give you more time um and then you if you really want to like these are nuances but if you really want to limit it then you instead of instead of first doing the analysis of the rhythm and saying oh it's a shuggle rhythm and then compress now and then compressing 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 and then doing the like while you're loading and then doing get the little bit of shock then maybe you want to do just loading all the time because then you're ready to the deli to deliver the shock if it's a shuggle rhythm right away and if it's not a shuggle rhythm then you just reset uh, the defibrillator and, and go again makes sense all right and we talked about this four joule per kilo if it's refractory then you may go up to uh, six joules per kilo maybe eight joules per kilo sometimes all right um and then once you've like done your analysis and it's a shock maybe shuggle rhythm maybe not shuggle rhythm then you wait until the next rhythm until you do your uh, pulse checks right um because you don't want to if, if they do for some reason get rusk and they become awake in that middle period then it's all right you're not mm, damaging anything so they can you can you can push on the chest a little, little while more all right a few big things about back valve ventilation because that's something that is hugely important in e -pals. so first the indications so when do we do back valve ventilation well in adults we will mainly do it when someone is hypo um uh, what's it called brady 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 New York, meaning that they are they're they're not breathing um as as <laughs> frequently as they should <coughs> so that may be if they have a respiratory frequency of under 10 in adults under 12 10 to 12 um then you may uh, do that or, or if they're desetting even though they have 15 liters of air on them then you kind of with back valve ventilation you, you may be able to do like a small peep what you actually want to do uh, if you cannot find a reversible course for it then you want maybe that's it's a bridge until you can in, intubate them right um but if you do have a reversible course maybe your it's a opioid intoxication then you can give uh, that and then it will be usually helpful right in smaller children even though they are not hypoventilating and even though they're not desetting sometimes it may if they have if they're pulling small titles like small tidal volumes they're 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 shallow breathing like really really small children like, like below one year then some of our course instructors said that they, you may want to consider doing it and then if they're accepted then you should continue doing it <laughs> But usually it's only for desetting or if they're retain, re, have a, like hypoventilation. Um, because sometimes these small children, they will be um, retaining CO2, even though they're trying to wash it out by hypoventilating um, because they don't have the marginals and they're like decompensating. And even though they're trying to compensate, it's not enough. So then you may like theoretically be able to help them. But in general it's reserved for those cases that i just mentioned um and then of course in, adult, in adults if you have a carbon 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 uh, or pco2 narcosis like carbon oxide uh, dioxide narcosis then um, you actually want a niv or bipav but if you don't have that at hand you may be able to um, help a bit with this with the ventilation <clears throat> All right, so how do you do it? Well, the size of the mask is important in children. It should not touch the eyes uh, or the orbita, uh, like the, the or the what do you call it, the uh, 
the the medial aspects of the eyes you should not touch those because if you press on those they may become vagal uh, so that's not a good thing um, you you grip it with the ce grip um, so me making a c with your index finger and your thumb and then an e with your last three fingers make sure that you are doing a jaw thrust like pushing the the, the chin forward and and with your sometimes oftentimes your little finger and then you are um with your um, um th uh, with your uh, third and fourth finger you're on the um on the uh, lower aspects of the jaw um, making sure that you're not touching the soft parts in the middle of the uh, on, of the mouth uh, under the mouth like where the tongue lies uh, because that will collapse the, the airway especially in small children um and what you actually want to do is like you want to deliver an, an even pressure not a hard pressure but an even pressure over the entire surface of the mask and what you, how, how to do that well the, like the e pelts course and the erc in children at least recommend that you do a double hand grip so if you have the resources then someone is on the air like someone is holding the mask tight and only have that job and uh, with two hands and then someone is um, using the back and then you want to be opening the airway and i don't have a picture of this but you m m probably know already that sniffing position in really really small children like in, in infants is a neutral head position like meaning that you have a towel under their shoulders um so that because they have relative big heads so that their body needs to be above their <laughs> like when they're lying, lying flat they their body needs to be a little bit elevated so that they can get that get that neutral head position um, and as they become older and older towards towards adults um where adults want the sniffing position where it's like um hyper extending the neck and then if you can then also pushing the neck forward um then then that is what what sniffing position is, is in adults and um, the older the child gets the more like adults they get so you need to adjust the, ne the neck depending on the age all right mm. then the rate um during cardiac arrest if you have a patient who's intubated not like you do 15 2 until they're intubated but once they can become intubated you can ventilate continuously and you may think these uh, these numbers are low but the reason why they're a bit low is because and also for adults i think it's 10 to 12 um rates per minute and and the reason why they're a bit low uh, like uh, as opposed to their normal vital uh, respiratory rates it, that's a balance between blowing too much air into the chest making a effective obstruction obstructive uh, like obstruction on the heart uh, so like when you're compressing the chest you want there to be low pressures on the chest right but when you're when you're like doing back valve masking or blowing up the lungs then you're creating pressure so we want you want that, that it's a balance of not um not having too much pressure in the lungs uh, so that the compressions are effective and also giving them the oxygen right um i encourage you to instead of no always oh, it's it's 25 you can never get 25 what is 25 divided by 60 right how many a minute or a second do you sorry how many a second do you need um so let's say 20 that's easy that's um once every three seconds so it's one two blow one two blow and in if it's 10 then uh, which is the adult one is then it's once every six uh, seconds so it's one two three four five six uh, in the sixth you blow and then you continue right and then that's really hard when you're stressed you usually hyperventilate the patient and that can be detriment detrimental um if you wash out their co2 instead of like keeping in a in normal capnary level if, especially if they have brain injury okay how, how, how hard are you supposed to push um and this this was a really important point in epals and i once that i one i i really take with me um is that um you look for ch you, how, how do you know whether you're getting uh, air in the patient's chest well you could have an end title that not many of us have that 
So what are you looking for? You're looking for chest rise. And you can use this in neonates as well. If you don't have a new puff, then you can use a back bell mask. And then you can, like, just with a few fingers in children, you don't really, really don't need, like, the entire hand pushing. You can just push with a few fingers on the, on the, on the back and then um, easily, just, just maybe a, a, fifth, a fourth or a fifth in, like, so you, you're not even squeezing the back. You're just gently pressing on it. And that's usually enough for, for, to get chest rise. Anything more than that, you will not get. You'll 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 just blow um, air into the stomach, and that's problematic, right? Um, and then there's two sizes of of ampu bags or, or or whatever you call them, Laradol bags, um, um, BVMs, bag bell masks, and. Um, you have the 250 milliliters, that's only for neonates, and then you have the 50, 500 milli, uh, milliliters for everyone else. And then you have this dopes mnemonic, and I think it's really good, this dopes mnemonic. So every time you, f you have some kind of something in, in, the, in, in the patient, um, mainly used for the airway, but can also be used for drains, uh, like chest drains, then you think about if okay, I've intubated the patient or I'm back valve masking the patients, but it but it's going the wrong way. It went good, but now it's going the wrong way. They're desetting, they're crashing. Is something I've done. So you think of D as dislodgement or displacement. Displacement. So have I ex ex accidentally, uh, if it's intubation, have I extubated the patient? Or is the is the is the tube in the hole or is it not? Um, it can be. Is there an obstruction? Right. Um, so displacement in back bell masking could be that I'm not having a tight seal. Um, uh, is there an obstruction in intubation? There might be um, foreign body airway obstruction. There might be um, secretion in the uh, tube. So you need to suck uh, suck the tube dry. Um, there might be a pneumothorax, meaning that you're creating if when if you're pushing positive air into the lungs and you may be creating a, a potential pneumothorax and you need to um, make sure that that is uh, being dealt with. And then the equipment, there might be equipment failures, some parts of the equipment may be uh, damaged. Um, and it's, it's a good like habit to just go from the source, like the hole in the, like the trachea and, and through the tube, through the, um, through the back valve mask, if that's what you're doing, or through the ventilator, all the way. Is are there any other obstructions like kinks on the on the tube, or like check the tubing? Is it or if it's a if if it's a chest strain, is it closed? Right? Is there a star obstruction on, on it? So that is it is really good. And then the last one is stomach or stacked stacked breaths. Sometimes it's called, and that's so for asthmatic patients on a ventilator. That's when you when you want to start off with just disconnecting the ventilator, right? Um, so if it's an event, crashing on events, according to Justin Morgenstern and the the, the um, Scott Weingard ERC book, uh, then you just disconnect um, the ventilator and uh, that should be good enough. Um, because then, then sometimes you will have these stacked breaths that asthmatics can have. That, uh, like, uh, they, they don't really ex exhale all the way, so they will accumulate stacked breaths and then you just have to, until they kind of almost explode, right? So that's when you want to like just disconnect the ventilator and then that's all right. Um, for smaller children, especially, they can be really, really sick if they have a, they, they can seem like toxic almost if they're, uh, if they have a full stomach with air. So you need to look a, uh, think about putting in a, um, uh, a nas nasogastric tube to uh, deflate the stomach. So that's just a few, a few things about back valve masking. For the EPALs, this is really important, and you need to do this really good, because um, um, that you're you're being judged on that. <laughs> All right. And but for real life, if if you, Ruben, I, I've done an entire long video on airway, uh, on, on a video series. Check out Ruben Strayer's back valve masking video as well. That's really good. Okay. And then. We talk about cardiac arrest still, the four H's and four T's. And what I always want is um, for each H and T, I want something to, how do I identify what it is and how do I treat it? And that's exactly what they've done here in the UK Resuscitation Council. So you can check through the list. What I want you to do in the, in the cardiac arrest scenarios, I want you to, once you have the compression and defibrillation team going, then you don't, then you ask a then your team, lead, team leader, you have to cognitive deload. And you just say you run the the, the the analysis and all that. 
I don't care. Um, if you have a good team, then you step into the uh, like in the background and then you think about these things. Okay, hypoxic. Okay, uh, is there any history in, that suggested have we intubated the patient? Um, no, we haven't. Okay, are we ventilating the patient at least? Okay, we are. Then we, if it's not too big a risk, then we or too big a uh, thing, then we can intubate later. Um, unless it's an asthmatic patient uh, or an anaphylaxis patient, then we do it right now and we do don't do compressions until we've done that. <clears throat> Hypovolemia, have we have we done a um, um, yeah, do we have a, a line? Do, can we get fluid boluses? Uh, can we see that there is an, uh, the bleeding with focus or, or is it a hyperdynamic heart, right? Uh, uh, hypo, uh, hypo or hyper electrolytes. So that's hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia or hypocalcemia, or it's hypoglycosis, -glyco uh, like low blood sugar. And that's not usually part of it, but it's, that's definitely something that you can go into cardiac arrest for. Um, as usually taking a blood gas and if it's too late in the, <laughs> if you've already been on the chest for 30 minutes, then sometimes it, like potassium is already high and you just for good measures you can might as well just try to uh, treat empirically with calcium uh, gluconate just make sure that it's like calcium gluconate is non not as toxic for 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 um, vessels as calcium chloride is but calcium gluconate has the a, a third of the potency of the calcium chloride so usually internationally you would say 10 milliliters of calcium chloride but it, that, that corresponds to 30 milliliters of calcium gluconate, 10%. Just, yeah. And in Sweden, uh, for some reason, uh, they always say 10 milliliters in the guidelines, but they should be probably, uh, for all I can, I don't know, it's, it, it should be 30 instead. All right. Um, and of course, you correct glucose. If that's low, um, it's easy to just get calcium and glucose and yeah if you have that kind of uh, you think that might be it um there was this danish study uh, saying a big rct saying that empirically calcium uh, is not a good idea and i that's probably right um that it isn't at least not helpful to do to do that hyperthermia as a special situation but we'll usually from the history you'll see that um Thromboembolism, like if you, focus is good if you have it on the chest while it's happening because the the, the, the heart will blow up um, uh, after a while, like after a few minutes of CPR, and the her, the, the the right chamber, the the right ventricle will blow up, and will look like there's a D D sign or it looks like it's distended because it is, but not from pulmonary embolism necessarily. So that clue becomes false positive if you have too much time um, on the chest. Um, so that's not a focus is not a good idea there um, unless you can do it, uh, a DVT scan. And that in that case it might be a good idea. Um, all right, then ten, and then the, the treatment is IV thrombolysis. Um, usually it would be ten bolus and then ninety over an hour but here it's 50 and then 50 again and for children i'm not sure actually what the doses are um then it's probably kilo based but that would have to be looked up looked up um then tensin muno and pneumo here we like tensin muno pneumo and tamponade and also hypovolemia and and the um uh, uh, hypoxia that that's the um what you call the hot algorithm for traumatic cardiac arrests and we'll we'll talk about it later um, and also the tamponade, yeah. But you'll look for those with focus and sense in pneumo, pneumo is something that you'll look for when when you're doing the their inflations with the back valve mask. Then you have the, uh, your stethoscope or you you have your point ultrasound and you can see whether they're sliding or not. If you really want to do that, otherwise you can just empirically poke the chest, like do finger thoracostomies if it's a trauma. But if it's a non-trauma. Or, or you may have a high risk, or like if they just put in a CVK, then well, maybe then there might be, or if, or if you just started uh, intubating them and you 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 forgot your your dopes algorithm, right? And they're deteriorating and they're deteriorating, and you didn't think about pneumothorax for it, then that could also be the case, right? 
that you just intubated and delivering, delivering high pressure to something that it was a normal pneumothorax and now it's tension pneumo. Um, and then you have the toxic uh, cases. And the toxic in children is ma mainly medications. It may be that they're on beta blockers. They may be on something else. And you may have to treat that. And with, like the uh, naloxone is one, opioids, right? But there are other, other reversing agents as well. All right. Then for cardiac arrest in special circumstances. So you have traumatic cardiac arrests, right? Um, and ERC guidelines, this is, this is like ERC guidelines saying like this, don't pump on, on an empty heart. Um, and I guess if it's an obvious trauma, like we'll talk about in trauma, you, you may not know whether it's obvious trauma or not. Sometimes there's a medical cause for the trauma and then there might be several reasons, but most traumatic cardiac arrests are quite straightforward. It's only a trauma cause. And for those uh, like pumping on the chest to make circulation of some, like there's no blood there if it's hypovolemic or there's obstructive cardiac arrest, so there you cannot pump around. So there's it doesn't matter. Don't don't pump on an empty heart. That's the same. Uh, so you should not do compressions, or you should at least deprioritize compressions um, in favor of these. Because once the traumatic cardiac arrest comes in, you will do, you will make sure that there's a line, uh, either IOs or IVs, and then you get blood, um, and then you'll try to stop the bleeding if there's a bleeding source somewhere. Um, then you'll give oxygen. Uh, sorry, the oxygen is intubation. And you'll do it. Then you'll, if there's a tension, then you don't care if there's a tension pneumo, pneumo. You'll just do bilateral finger thoracostomies. And I'll show you how to do those in a little while. Um, you don't have to put in the chest strain. And um, then you'll do, um, then you'll check for tamponade. And if it's a traumatic one, then preferably if you have, in, in, if, if you're in a center that can do that, you'll do an emergency thoracotomy. Um, and if you cannot do that, well, then you might think, try, try to do a pericardial synthesis. But if it's coagulated blood and there's a hole in the heart, then you will need a, some kind of thoracotomy. But sometimes you, by doing this, by 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 healing the other stuff, then then this might be stable enough to get to the OR as well. So, uh, yeah, you can ch check out this hot mnemonic uh, in EM cases. Then you have, if you have someone who is hypoxic uh, and a hypoxic uh, asthma patient or an anaphylaxic patient. So that, this would be um, the um, anaphylaxic patients with asthma symptoms or just pure asthma or asthma patient who is um, becoming unconscious. Once they're unconscious, that's a cardiac arrest situation. You will, as team leader, say this is a cardiac arrest, but don't push on the chest because they have deoxygenated blood. It's very rare for an anaphylaxis to go into um, a um, cardiac arrest from a shock. In, uh, and if they do, this algorithm was, will be good as well because it's pseudopia. And so like it's not a shock algorithm. It's you, probably a low flow state where you need to um, give them the same kind of treatment. So, And the AMAX4 algorithm, I cannot encourage you enough to just go in and check uh, this sad, sad story, but also very inspiring for the emergency physician involved in this. Um, and I already made a video, a separate video on this, you can check out. So the algorithm here is give adrenaline one microgram per kilo, um, or 0 0.01 uh, milligram, uh, 0 0.001 milligrams per kilo, sorry. And, um, and this is where I said, take one milliliter syringe and, and take the cardiac, cardiac rest <laughs> epi. And uh, then you then you uh, draw from there. If it's a 22 kilo child, then you'll uh, use just uh, of that one milliliter of 0 0.1 milligram per milliliter adrenaline. You will only use 0 0.2 milliliters uh, or 0 0.22 milliliters over that. Okay. Um, you'll use muscle relaxants and just push 100 of uh, like a, a big dose of rocuronium. If you're in shock, then you as a rule of thumb, you half or you, you you half your induction agents, or even less, give even less induction agents, um, and you double your um, relaxation agents, right? Um, and then you you will not back bell mask the patient. You need to intubate them. 
um, because if you don't intubate them, uh, then the pressures in, the, in their lungs are too big. They cannot be, you cannot use an LMA, you cannot use back valve masking because you'll just blow up their stomach. You need to intubate them to de de deliver these high pressure, like to live, deliver effective ventilation to them. And they will be, ven you, they will be ventilated uh, like they're ventilating, it's like ventilating a brick. And they will often develop pneumothoraxes, so, so look out for that. Then we'll have to do the bilateral thoracostomies quite early on. Um, and yeah, and you, the thing is, you only have four minutes for this. So this adrenaline dose, it's the reason why it's IV is because the uh, half time is only, like, or sorry, the time to affect IV is a few minutes, whereas it's in intramuscular, it's maybe eight to ten minutes, and in in uh, if it's sub -Q, sub Q, it's been given it's given subcutaneously uh, by accident. It's 20 minutes, so you don't have the time. You need to give it IV if they're becoming unconscious. All right. And here, as I, as I said again, we're not compressing the chest. We're doing these things that are more important. If it's a pregnant patient, then you do pure mortem C-section within four to five minutes on mom's indication, not the child's. Um, where you do a vertical incision from the uh, cyphoid onto the suprapubic bone, and you go uh, just below, uh, you just rotate. Uh, you don't go through the, the um, belly button because that's hard to cut through. All right, um, and then you um, do a um, another vertical, like you just do a small nick in the uterus. Then the water will come out, and then you will um, with a scissor clip uh, from south to north on the uterus and then you'll deliver the child um, and then give them to a neonatal uh, care person will go through neonatal recess right away <laughs> and you'll sew up the heart uh, sew up the wound and then usually like that that will help the patient become get brusque again but you'll still have to look out for the four h's and t's in pregnant patients to what is the cause of this it might be a tvt or lung pulmonary embolism but they they may then after the child is out be good enough to actually get rosk but if they're not and if they have a pe then it's a really huge problem because now they have a hole in their stomach and you have to give them thrombolysis but yeah Hypothermia, you probably know already that below 30 degrees, um, there are some incredible stories of children if they become hypothermic and then get cardiac arrests and not get cardiac arrest and then become hypothermic, then they have uh, incredible survival stories. We have a, a few from Denmark, from the um, from the Pasto um, Priest Island uh, incident. Pasto Ulykken. Um, all right. Um, so if you, you're below 30 degrees, you do don't you don't give any drugs. You may defib maximally three times. You you may do do intermittent compressions or compressions only. If you're above 30 degrees, then you give then you then you do drugs. You do give drugs, but at a double interval. All right. If you have this refractory VF VT like more than three times or three times or more, then you will give a mirrorin, but you don't usually don't think it works. It has a high number needed to uh, a high number needed to treat. So, the new thing that just came out, um, maybe two years ago or one year ago, is this double defib, um, where you place both anterior lateral anterior lateral pads and uh, anterior posterior pads, uh, and then you then you, you give two shocks, um, double defib or dual 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 sequential defib. Check out Rebel, Rebel EM or first ten first ten EM for details on this. Um, then you have pseudopia, and this is another concept that's come in the last couple of years, where we think that um, if you have on the non-shockable rhythm side, um, then you, but you have a, you may not have a palpable pulse by fingers, but you have a pocus pulse, meaning that you have a pulse, uh, but it's just subclinical to feel, and you and you're not fusing, you're 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 being, you are unconscious, and you're not breathing uh, normally. So you are in a low flow state, but they're probably survivable uh, more so than no flow states. So uh, they should probably be treated like sharks, um, these patients. And that's why maybe if, if you're anaphylaxic, even if you're if you're if even if it was the shock that is the reason for your um, for your um, um, cardiac arrest, then it's probably a good idea to give give adrenaline anyway and prioritize that. 
And usually these patients will need a noradrenaline drip and treat the underlying cause for the shock. Pad placement for children um, and adults is like this. It's vertical now. It used to be horizontal here, but now it's vertical so that um, there's less risk that this pad is going and, and this, the current is going like that. We want the current to be going between the heart. We want the chest to be no sweat. We want the chest to be bare. And then we need to use the right amount of joules. And then we'll put one here and here for the anterior lateral position, which has, in, at least in, in synchronized uh, cardioversion, um, in a Danish study, been shown, in a recent Danish study, been shown to be preferable to the anterior posterior position. But whether or not that's extrapolated, uh, extrapolatable to these uh, cardiac arrest conditions is unknown. So, and especially in children, like in smaller children, doing like this, they will overlap, so you cannot do that. You will need to do an anterior-posterior um, positioning. Um, right. And then if you want to do a double defib, then you do a... Um, so this is on between the um, uh, shoulder blades, and this is on the left side of the, of the chest. And um, then you will just combine these two, and then you have the double defib with one second in between the teeth. So first this and this, and one second later, or, or the other way around. Okay, so here are the algorithms. Oh, here is the full algorithm of the cardiac arrest in children. So this is the BLS, the basic. Um, if they're unresponsive, uh, you open the airway and see if they have a normal breathing. If they do have that, then you do the deliver the five rescue breaths, either by mouth or by a back well mask. And then you re-evaluate for signs of life. If they don't have signs of life, then you go into the 15-2 um, um, cycle. And uh, here you like pick this up in the advanced, where you then 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 here comes in a, a um, def defibrillator into the algorithm. And you once the defibrillator is there, even though there's a low likelihood of that actually being relevant. Then also in the children, then the, the you will as 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 just like in adults, as as um, as soon as the fifth layer is there and the pads are on, then you'll do a quick analysis, and then either you'll be in the non shuggable rhythm, or the sh uh, or, sorry the non shuggable um, pathway or the shuggable pathway. All right. Yeah. Then. There are other of these algorithms that the EPELS course teaches, and one of them is the uh, foreign body airway obstruction. So, if you have a foreign a suspected foreign body airway, which is usually small child suddenly becomes uh, dyspneic, maybe with strider, and they're coughing. Okay, so if they have an effective cough, then you just say good, uh, like they, then you just encourage them. Come on, you can cough it, cough that up. All right, go, go, go. Don't touch them uh, because there's a risk of them getting the thing into their airway even more if you touch them. So um, if they're becoming, and if they are suddenly developing an ineffective cough, then uh, you will call for help. Um, and once they, um, once you call for help, then you will uh, do uh, back blows. Um, first five back blows. Um, and if possible, uh, like especially in small children, you'll try to have them um, have them uh, use gravity to like so you have to tilt them a bit so that their head is down, and then in the middle of the chest uh, chest wall on the back, you will be like hit quite hard so that you think each hit is going to push that thing out. Um, you know, so for, let's start for with small children like infants, then you will have them on your on your arm. Um, and holding like when you have you have them on maybe your left arm with your stomach on your lower arm and then in your hand you have their face holding their face uh, so that it's not wobbling and then you will push um, five times uh, hard on the um, on their chest um, back chest wall um, um, not straight ahead but like in in the motion where we want the the thing to shoot out of their lungs like so from kind of a 40 45 degree angle and then in like into the chest with your hand with the palm like the palm of your hand do that five times and then you then once you once you've done the five times then you'll 
uh, take the um, the child's like you have the child uh, lying on on their stomach on your on, on your forearm, and um, the, then you will take their um, you'll take the, your your other arm and then um, like almost do a strangle grip a fork grip you can call it and then you'll turn them like a pancake onto the uh, on the other arm so that now they're on your under forearm like your other forearm but on their back and then you'll push um uh, on the um lower like the um the lower part of the chest um uh, and hoping that it'll shoot out well and you'll just push with two fingers if it's a bigger child then do almost as an adult you will take one um folded hand into the lower uh, like just below the rib cage where it's soft and then you'll take your other hand in and fold it over that hand um so you have one hand as fist and then one hand that is over that fisted hand and you'll push into the stomach and up so making the lungs like can kind of be used like a uh, like a blowing device and if they had, and you continue doing this, and if they at any point become unconscious, meaning that here they're coughing, but they're coughing ineffectively. So here's, uh, uh, here's, uh, uh, and then they, then you do this, and then if they become unconscious, then you are in the cardiac arrest scenario. And actually, like the epals, they encourage you to do it like this. Open the airway and try five rescue breaths. And I, th I guess that I guess the theory here is that you can. It might maybe just a partial obstruction, so you may get some oxygen down into the lungs. Um, and do not do any blood sweep. But if they do have something in their mouth, like that you can see, then you may be able to just pick it out. Um, and if this doesn't work. Then right away you will go into um, 15 to like cardiac arrest mode. And the theory here is that if you're just pushing the chest now, then and maybe the thing may shoot out because you're doing compressions. But an advanced way that we teach in the EMCC course is that um, what we actually want to do as well uh, is do a quick laryngoscopy if you have a laryngoscope, like not like and and use and and then use McGill's uh, and McGill's like a, a, a holding device to go in and pick out the thing if you can and if you cannot pick out the thing or if it's too round or too like you cannot get a grip then you take a tube and you push it down into the right um, bronchi bronchia like the the, the right lung right main stem and um, then, then, they, then they can breathe again, right? So even though they don't have one lung, then they can breathe again. Um, another way that is taught in SWISM, the Swedish Emergency Medicine course, uh, or Swedish, Swedish Emergency Medicine um, organization, uh, and in our EMCC course, is um, jet ventilation. And I guess it's more of a novelty. It's really hard. I, I guess it's we, we like you do a needle crack thyroidectomy and like you find the thyroid membrane and then you do a needle crack and then you do an inflation from there with um, jet ventilation and i've done a video on that if you want to check that out on my airway series videos all right just let's take let's talk about neonatal resource so this is not part of the epals course as the, we cannot do we cannot get an exam case that is this but we can get um we can get um what you may call um we can get uh, uh we are uh, like taught taught this and and then we, we we can get this as emergency physician sometimes if you if you have deliveries in the parking lot then you may need to know something about this and i have i've done this a lot because i'm a, I've, i do work in pediatrics and as a pediatric um like doctor um, on call and you'll do a lot of these uh, in Denmark at least so here are some of the um, like brief references you may want to check out and so the ERC guideline looks like this and then you have the 
um, the Swedish and the neonatal guideline that looks like, looks like this. And the main difference between these two, other than this, I think is more uh, is easier to read, and it goes through an ABC algorithm, that, which is nice. Um, is that the Swedish one doesn't encourage us to do uh, what they call inflation breaths. So, um, but this done, this one goes to when inflation breaths first, and then it goes to ventilation. This algorithm, I always think, looks much more daunting than like there's a discrepancy between how daunting this looks and how easy. Quote, like, it's not easy, but how few steps there actually is um, in, in the neonatal resource. Most children don't need much, uh, and we should not be afraid of doing what they need. So I'll make a more simple um, algorithm here, um, because most of this is not needed. And why? Because 85% of all births, uh, this is from ERC, um, data from ERC, 85% of all births, they breathe spontaneously. 10% of them need some basic steps, maybe trying, stimulating, and basic A maneuvers and CPAP. And then in the last 5% of these, like so 1 in 20, they may need these inflation breaths. Um, that we'll talk about, or short of insulations, depending on which algorithm you're going to use. And then most of these will become better but a mind, very, very minority, they will need intubation or need compressions or need adrenaline. So compressions is not uncommon. I've seen it a quite uh, a, a few times. So that's not uncommon. And, and it's, in my opinion, not 0.3%. Um, but it may, but, but it's a little bit more, but, but, it's, uh, but as you see, it's really rare that we go to the, like where we need to give adrenaline, which is far, far down the algorithm. So in fact, for emergency physicians, we should probably just like, it's the top part of the algorithm, the AP part. This is really where we need to know our stuff. So what I actually think we should be teaching as well is what I think is really hard when we, we are in these scenarios is that we need to think about preparation. So this is a sacrist table or a neonatal table. And when you are waiting for the delivery to come out or a birth, to, uh, like a child to be birthed, then, um, and as a pediatric, um, um, pedi pediatrician, um, you're waiting in the room, be um, besides, um, the, the, the maternity ward, and then you're doing this preparation here. So this is my checklist, um, and um, I've made a video on this where I go through how, how I do it in real life uh, on my um, YouTube channel, so you can check that out. But you want to check the basics. You want to do I need help? Yeah, um, I need a cord clamp, cord clamping set, and we want to if we can clamp, clamp the cord in 60 to 90 minutes after birth, um, so that or you want to milk the placenta. Um, you want to turn on the heat up here and down here, and you want to have a clock so you can start the clock, and you want to calculate wet bags. You also want a lot of towels, both to put in a, a horseshoe so, so that the airway is like a neutral position, a sniffing position, but also so that because one of the main things here is to stimulate and dry the baby off, and you should be packing the baby in not wet towels because they're wet when they come out you dry them and then you throw away the towels and you have a new towel to warm them because they lose heat really easily um on a uh, things you want to um, prepare suction 15 kilopascals um and you want to test that they're working so you're testing it and you're testing with your fingers to see that they're sucking as they should um, a or airway adjuncts you have up here. You will check that the towel is in optimal sniffing position. We just talked about that. You will have advanced stuff as well. I usually don't prepare that um, because that's my 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 um, senior <laughs> doctor who will do those things. Um, but we but I might just say like okay the sizes are there the LMAs that I need are there and especially the LMAs are sometimes needed. Um, also down here, intraosseous needle, needles might also be needed. Need then B, um, you, this is the, what you really need, uh, and we need to be comfortable with. You need to use the Neopuff that's usually attached here, but you, uh, and Neopuff is like a device where you can um, both. 
give blows, give air, um, but you, and there's also a CPAP function in it. So it's almost, almost like a BiPAP um, where you manually control it. So um, the um, the settings will be like this. You, you will do the settings. So you'll turn on, uh, turn it on, and and, and uh, the settings are for inflations are. 30 um, centimeters of water, and, and you'll use room air unless it's uh, unless it's a preterm, um, or and and the saturation will rise the first 10 minutes. So if there if it hasn't arisen enough during the first 10 minutes, then you'll use more oxygen. Then you'll put the CPAP settings on four to six or six to six to eight, depends on Canadian guidelines. Says six to eight. And European, I think, says four to six is on is on the on the flow chart you just saw. Um, yeah, you want to use the correct sizes mask. You want to have several to choose from. Um, and if you don't have a, as we said, if you don't have any uh, new puff, then you will use the two hundred fifty milliliters backwell mask. And you don't want to, you don't know the pressures here, but you want to. Uh, see for chest rise and you just barely want to have chest rise uh, that's enough don't uh, inflate the chest hyperinflate the chest uh, like don't hyperinflate the chest yeah then you'll check saturation on the right arm not on the, not on the left arm because of uh, vascular anatomy and then on C you want to prepare that you have a stethoscope you want ECG electrodes and you want to have the advanced stuff ready if you need to adrenaline and uh, um, umbilical cord catheter uh, on or intraosseous needle just make sure like just know that the intraosseous needles they dislodge really easily uh, so this is the better way in these children you may you don't need you notice you can put a um, uh, a, uh, ben, uh, a, uh, a line inside like a pvk a peripheral venous catheter into the um, navel like the vein as well and you want fluid bolus uh, ready. Uh, it's really rare that we need C, probably C things. It's usually just A things that are important. All right, so we have prepared the stuff that we need. Then we, then here comes the baby. We start the clock and we try and stimulate. Um, and then we do, uh, like, and we try and stimulate, throw away the towels, try and stimulate some more, put on a small hat um, on the child. And then we do an, uh, like a, a semi apgar score where we do the most important things at a heart rate and we kind of show with our hand how how fast it's going because this is bad that's under 60 but this this is good and this this is somewhat good right as in between so we can we, we can sh share our that information with the entire room when we're stethoscoping the child um, if we have a lot of the team members, then we might just do a ECG monitoring. Then we, when we don't have to, to to show with our finger, like that. All right, respiratory rate, we uh, or resp like or not rate, rate but also the, how are they breathing? Are they having sounds or, or are they breathing normal? Like a cry is perfect. That's the normal breathing. If they're not crying, um, then, then then they're not. Then then they may be like. <laughs> Like um, CPAPing themselves, uh, or they might not be breathing at all. And then you have the tone. The other things that go into the Afghar is the grimacing, the facial expression, and the um, the color, and they they are not as important. So if they have a good tone, they have a heart rate of over like the heart rate is either under sixty or over a hundred. Uh, like oh, it's sixty and hundred are the like the the ones that we need to remember. Um, but here's over 100 as normal. And then out of, uh, or that uh, it's, it should be well over 100. But it's, yeah, if it's well over 100 and they're doing uh, uh, still, then you may just be doing CPAP on them. It may be wet lungs. That's the most common part, common reason. But if they're not breathing normal or if they have a, a heart rate of under 60 to 100, then in Sweden, you will go th straight to the 60 inflations or ventilations. And you'll just, um, sorry, not inflation breast, but 60, vent, like 60, like ventilation with a rate of 60 per minute. Meaning, want, 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 like every time. But in the ERC, they want to do these inflation breaths first. 
Um, and these are like long inflations where you push on the new puff for two to three seconds and then they blow up their chest. What is again really important, and they emphasize these hypoxemia, like the heart rate is low, but but um, if you don't get air into their lungs, then it doesn't matter if you pump on the chest. So you need to get the air into the lungs. So the, most of this algorithm is about, am I sure that I'm getting air into the lungs? So what can I do? Well, I can do a mask, this is called Mestosopa algorithm. Like, what are the reasons why I'm not getting chest rise when I'm trying to do this? Well, like mask adjustment is the M. Um, I can do a different mask. I can do it by manual technique. I can uh, so on and so forth, right? Then reposition the airway so that I'm in sniffing position, in neutral head position. I can do suction. Suction has gone down into the guidelines, so that's not important anymore, unless they have like a lot, a lot of lot of of of, of, of um, stuff in their mouth. Um, then it is important, but usually suction is low, low on the list of things that we want to do. Um, uh, and they would do it blindly, and it's usually always a part of the intubation effort. Um, then you want to open the airway with jaw thrust or OPA or an MPA, right? Um, you may want to do a bit more pressure, um, and you may want to do an artificial airway like an LMA or an ECI, ECI right? That's the Mr. Sopa. That's how you can make sure that there's inflations. And then you, then you, if there is inflations, and then then you just then you do um, these five. And you're sure they're there, and then you do, then, and then you uh, do ventilations after that for 30 seconds. Then you reevaluate. Evaluate. Has the heart rate gone up? Maybe it's it was 70, and now it's 80. Okay, then I'll keep doing these because it's helping. But maybe it's below 60 still, and it's not really moving in the right direction. It's just stabilizing or stabilized um, in a bad way. So you have three options. You either um, and this is from the Swedish one. I think it's better in that way. So either you have chest rise, uh, oh, sorry, you don't have chest rise, then you let that's that's part of the algorithm, or you have uh, the heart frequency is going up as we just talked about, even though it's maybe under 60. If it's going up, 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 then it's keep keep doing what you're doing. It's helping, but if it's not moving, um, it's not rising. Then you'll then you'll According to the Swedish one, um, you'll put in a laryngeal mask, LMA, which is quick, and then you'll go to this, like the 30, uh, 1 compressions. Um, if, um, and that's that's also part of the ERC guideline, uh, the EPALS guideline, but it's not as emphasized that we need to, we, we, I think it says consider doing it, uh, an intubation or an LMA. But in the Swedish one, we, they want to do an MLA. All right, and then you have sizes down here. Okay, and if that's the case, then once you have the LMA in, or once you've considered getting the LMA in, depending on which guideline you want to do, then you do 15 cycles uh, every 30 seconds. All right, so it's one, two, three, pst, one, two, three. Pst. So one is doing bilateral chest compressions like with the thumbs on the on the chest and then hands uh, around the, the, the child and then you like one two three and you do 15 of these three to one every 30 seconds and that's fast and then you then you begin to prepare for all the advanced stuff and the advanced stuff is usually if you have a history of maybe blood in the blood in the belly like blood in the mother's belly, that means placental rupture or something bad, and the, pa and the baby may have bled out, so you want to give some kind of fluids, maybe blood, right? And the, you may get a pale baby out. There may be other th causes as well, right? But that's advanced. And what are what are our goals? Well, um, it's called stable. Sugar is no like after if you've done been here for 10 to 20 minutes then the sugar is going down really fast that's general for almost all pediatric patients once they're in a bad way critical then you want to check the sugar because they may not be hypoglycemic in usual cases but this like the work that they're doing for being for, for continuing being compensated is um is costing them a lot of sugar and energy 
temperature should be normal normal thermia if not they'll get um, paracetamol or stuff like that they need a patent airway that's part of the what we want oxygenation over 85 after 10 minutes it rises from i think 60 and then labs with normal p 2 and emotional support for the family so that's my algorithm here i think it's more simple um yeah, there are, you can go into details about this. I I, I don't want to do that um, here, uh, and it's in Danish. So, but in general, that's that's what what you want to do. The advanced stuff is um, so you do this uh, one two three pst, one two three, pst, and if it keeps being below sixty and it's not improving, then you want to intubate. I remember the LMA touch like it, it moves easily. So, so, uh, so you want to check that it's still, still like with dopes, that is still a patent airway. Um, consider pneumothorax, so your dopes algorithm is really good here. Um, you want to consider not giving naloxone because, yeah, the, if it's a mom, mom with opioids, that's one of the reasons why they might need help there. And you put in your um, catheter and then you can give drugs if you want to. All right. So that's that was the pediatric. If you if you have the quick look and they're not responding as you, as they should, uh, they are they are unresponsive or have abnormal abnormal breathing or a pulse over under sixty, then um, then you go into this. But now we'll go through this. First, the treat as you go well part of this ABC algorithm. So the medical part of this first. So the medical part of this is. Um, this is the algorithm that they, uh, the ABC algorithm that they encourage us to go through. Um, and there's lots of ways of cutting the ABC. Um, um, I think you should distinguish between having an ABC in trauma and an ABC in medical situations. And I think you have, to have as an emergency physician, need to know that there's a difference in the pediatric population as well. And this is a good suggestion for how the pediatric, uh, pediatric ABCs could look like. Um, I think that, I think that we, um, I think that we need to uh, go through this, the adult one first and then the EMCC, we usually, like, we usually encourage it to do a three things under A, four things under B, three things under C, three things, uh, four things under D, three things under E, it's like three, four, three, four, three, four. So, um, and you can check that out in the Swissum homepage if you want to, or the EMCC homepage. But here is like um, it's like three thing, maybe three things under A, it's four things under B, and it's five things under C, and it's I think it's three things again under D, and it's two things or so three things under E. Okay, so let's go through this. Go through this. Part of this algorithm is also what I just showed. Like if you uh, are you in the cardiac arrest mode, then that this is the, that part. All right. First of all, check the airway. Um, is it uh, and you want to um, like I usually would do looking in the mouth, uh, look, listen, feel for strider, um, and is the trachea like in the midline? Are there any signs of trauma, or do you need to palpate the neck? And are there any signs of like do you need, do you need the spinal mobilization? That's a good A. Um, and then you, from that, there's a result in this. They want you to say, is it, is it patent, like normal airway, um, or is it a um, obstructed airway, like we need to intubate now, or is it at risk airway, like a dynamic airway? It may be problematic, and that may be if the patient is snoring or if they're a bit unconscious, but they're still protecting it somewhat. Yeah. Then um, we go to the B part, and that's um, the R what, R W O T. That's 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 part of a. Um, so if you look, if you use echo, then R what is one of the measures that you use. I guess that's kind of rememberable. So R uh, R is for uh, respiratory frequency. Remember that in the child, the respiratory frequency and the pulse. Uh, you can I think is remove. Uh, it's not. I think it's not 10 from the respiratory frequency. It's 10 from the pulse, and 
uh, for every degree over 37.5, I think. So if the pulse is, I think, 100 and 160, then and the temperature is 40, then you may subtract maybe 20 to 30 heart rate points. Um, and then, okay, that's what is fever related, but is if, if the pulse is still above a certain amount, uh, like over the reference value, then, th there, then well, that is not only explained by the fever, there's something else, maybe dehydration, maybe shocked, uh, like so on. All right. Um, and it's also important for heart rate and respiratory frequency that the child is relaxing and is pain-free or at least pain-managed because then it's much easier to, to assess whether this is a true reason or is another reason. And I will repeat again, there's no one test that says that the child is in a bad way. It's the multiple the multitude of the tests and the, 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 the gestalt of all of it, the BBBs and all of these ABCDEs that are important. Okay, so the R is for respiratory frequency, the W is for work of breathing, you should look at the stomach, if there's a paradoxal breathing, the thorax, the neck, and the nose, and also like a head bop with small children. You look at oxygenation, for the saturation, um, like the pox um, on the finger, and that is also something that shows you the heart rate and the perfusion, so it's a really good test, the pox one. And then titles. And the e pulse wants you to auscultate the chest here, and but also you can just for check for, for whether the breathing is shallow or deep. Okay. Then you go for the um, yeah, of course, and the treatment here is to like put on oxygen if if they're in a bad way. Uh, the saturation for children should be 94 to 98, not not superoxic and not hypoxic. Okay. Then the five Ps, um, there's the pulse, the heart rate, so, so the pulse frequency. And there's the pulse volume, meaning that you look, you, you, you um, check the peripheral pulses and the central pulses and see if they are either absent, that's zero, or if they're full, that's two, and if they're somewhere in between, that's one. Um, then you look for the peripheral pressure, the sort of perfusion, and you um, do the um, calorie refill time where you can either press the fingers or the I usually press the sternum because that's usually not as cold um, because cold will make it longer falsely positive so uh, no so you push on the chest uh, or the sternum for five seconds one two three four five and in the scenarios then you'll like let you and when I do scenarios I'll say one two three okay so if it's two or below, then it's normal. If it's more than two, then it's abnormal. So three is abnormal. Again, you, just because you have three or four doesn't mean that you're in shock. If every, all the other param parameters looks good and the patient is not, like it, 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 that they're not, um, um, that they're actually looking at us and they're smiling or whatever, like they're, they're, they, you can get their attention with bubbles. Uh, and then, then I don't care that much about that. Um, but if um, if they're in a bad way and the pulse is high and they're not looking at me, and then then that's a problem, right? Um, then you check the skin. You check the skin to see whether it's cold, whether it's what the color is, if there's mottling, if it's sweaty, and so on. So that's three things. And then you check the blood pressure. That's usually not as important in smaller children and becomes more and more important as, as you grow older. Um, as a test, uh, the blood pressure is important in everyone, but as a test, it's not as reliable in the younger ones. It's hard to take as well. Um, yeah, and um, then the preload. And the preload is kind of if you have these decompensated children, either with an SVT or with, um, um, with a inborn error of the heart and um, you check for the abdomen you may check for leg edema you don't do that in the course you may check for but you check for crackles on on the auscultation part and you may check pocus for and, and jvp and you check an avp you need to go to d and you check for um, avpu um, having a pu is being unconscious um, kind of like the GCS of nine or below, but again, GCS is like, 
like Jesus of eight intubate is like a dead dogma. It, it's important in some cases, but you can have a lot of patients with a GCS of lower than that that can protect their airway fine. So it depends. Um, and uh, and again here it also depends. An AVPU is easy to do and it's quick. So it's, I like that. Pupils, just check if they're reacting or not. They don't have focal neurology here, and I guess I asked them this. I guess it's because it's not that common to have focal neurology in, in, in these patients. So, but if they have any obvious things, then you will check that. And also, neck stiffness is not part of this, but I think it's important to check that. If not, if it's not a trauma, and then glucose. Usually, a venous block gas at this point is good, but sometimes you don't get that. So, or, or in children, you'll get a capillary gas, or you can just take a blood blood glucose. Pain, um, in the E, you'll check for pain, temperature, and skin, and then you'll do the maples just to get the background history. <clears throat> or the ample, um, allergies, medicine, previously sick, and then last meal and exposure. Um, and maples is medicine, allergies, previously leisure, like social stuff, and um, ethanol, and also exposure, and, uh, and, and like drugs, and then smoking. But I think uh, vaccination should also probably be here. If they're not vaccinated, that's a big differential diagnosis um, pearl. All right. And then in trauma, we'll talk about that later, but there's a few th three more things that you want to do in trauma. And then when, you do when you've done something in e and in real life, you really want to do a real e re-evaluation, See if is it helping, is it not helping, and if it's not helping, then you want to maybe escalate and call for help. Then this great, great picture about about the uh, from the Sarah Krager in the ICU EDU. Here was the link. <laughs> so, in the EPELS and in real life, we talk a lot about compensated or decompensated shock, and I think this picture says it all. Um, a uh, if you think that the patient in compensated shock is, is swimming um, up a, a, a current, right, against the current, but they're compensating. They're, they're in the water, they're not moving anywhere. Um, they're out running because it's like a, it's an effort to be septic but compensating. And uh, they're compensating, they're compensating, but at some point they're not compensating anymore. Then they become decompensated. So uh, children will usually be tachycardic, tachycardic, and maybe on the Bs, they will be irritable, maybe have retractions and a CRT, not below two, but above two. Sorry, I, I, read, I, I got that wrong here. Um, yeah, and, and especially tachycardia. Uh, in trauma, they talked about, they should probably call it permissive tachycardia instead of um, the other stuff, because it's really important that children they compensate unlike adults they will compensate with tachycardia and then suddenly they will just drop off that cliff and become hypotensive decreased avpu like become irritable or become drowsy they will have lactate that is going up again lactate is in epals probably held up too high um, check out cliff's cliff reed's lectures on lactate but lactate is usually like it's, it's only Adrenaline, right? So um, it's just as a surrogate for adrenaline uh, in the body. So um, that doesn't mean that it's not shock, but it's it could easily just be that um, it's you you just have been hyperventilating or you have been puking, right? Or you have liver disease. So, um, but but yes, in the right context, lactate is a good marker um, for decompensated shock, probably. And then modeling is also one of those. So um, yeah, um, there's no like, this is a gray area in between. When are you compensated and when are decompensated? But at some point you, the body cannot keep up anymore and then you kind of fall behind it and that ends in, 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 in organ dysfunction. Yeah, please check out her videos. They're really great. And they, they, you have a new concept of how to, how to, um, how to treat shock and how to like approach shock. Yeah, an example of why this is so important. So if you have an SVT, like a supraventricular tachycardia, if it's compensated, then you'll use ice on the on the head, and then you'll use adenosine in the dose that we talked about, 0 0.1, then 0 0.2, then 0 0.3 milligrams per kilo. But if they're decompensated, 
or if they <laughs> I'll usually take pads on anyway but um, but don't use them if they're if they are good and on adenosine but if they do decompensate at some point then they will defib right if, we, if they do come become unconscious or if they get hypotensive or they get a they can become worse in these parameters right then then yeah here are the normal vital vital signs that the epals course want us to know um respiratory rate for uh, these guys and heart rate and blood pressure and what the only thing i want you to notice is that there's a p5 that's the um, permissive hypertension limit in trauma and then there's the p50 that's the permissive hypertension in trauma if they have um head injury right so that's not really have permissive hypertension you need a good blood pressure and, and both as adult or as child yeah and then i just wanted to show you that it's hard to distinguish between sinus tachycardia and supraventricular tachycardia but if it's if it's a ch if the child has uh, no like other signs of it, this being a secondary tachycardia and this seems like it's primary because it came on suddenly or at least it has a in 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 in, in adults it's usually i if you have a um, heart rate of above 140 150 maybe 160 uh in very young um people then then it seems like it's primary but if it's around 130 140 then it's more likely to be um secondary and this and especially if you have fever or other stuff so so that's the same thing in infants so if you have uh, in infants one above 220 maybe 240 260 then that is very likely to be a um, primary um, uh, arrhythmia and especially if it came on, came on abrupt but usually you just get a child that is not feeding and it's just a bit drowsy yeah and then have a tachycardia all right going through um this is not the full european trauma course uh, thing but <clears throat> just going through a little bit of it um so the european trauma course um and trauma like um the epals doesn't as we talked about in the beginning get all of the points from the ecc but I'll just see if, see if I can get some of them uh, over here so to, to get a more full picture of the trauma patient in pediatrics. So in general, I'm sorry for this being in Danish, but in general, children over 10 years should be properly treated as small adults in trauma. Um, children are soft, meaning that they have a soft skeleton with big organs and a big head uh, as opposed to a body. So most of the injuries occurring in children are injuries to their organs and usually they have to be treated only conservatively also when you're doing an e-fast on the stomach it's kind of hard it's not as good a test as it is in adults even though it's not a perfect test in adults at all um, it's a less sensitive test in, in in children so if it's negative in children then it doesn't mean that you rule out an intra abdominal bleed um in the in the in in, in um in the thorax though it's quite a good test but because um, the skeleton is soft then they can develop these injuries that are um, there's no broken bones or the bone just may be bended um, um, and that counts as a fracture as well some uh, like in, in the in the extremities but for instance you can have a lung contusion a severe lung contusion but no broken bones in the, in the thorax you can have um, what you call skiwara uh, s-c-i-w-o-r-a um, which is like a like a stunned or, or injury to your uh, medulla um, medulla spinalis or, or your spinal cord even though there are no broken bones uh, just because like yeah they're soft and they can get injuries even though there are no broken bones um and i guess like so pelvic injuries are rare it's not that common to get that they often get cold like a cold really fast so heat them fast um it's really important that you have a calm environment for them because if you do that then they don't become tachycardic also it's just ethical and it's nice to if my, if my child came in i want a calm environment and a nice uh, staff but 
um, if like for medical reasons, if they become tachycardic, then it's kind of hard to distinguish: are they in shock or are they not? Yeah. So, um, so you want them to not be falsely positively tachycardic. So you want them to be calm. You want the parents close by. You want all of these non-pharmacological things that we can do, distract them and with bubbles and so on, and be aggressive with painkillers. Um, cervical immobilization can happen if they're accepted but if they don't accept it then don't do it because then it will just push against the um, immobilization and that, that may be cause more injuries so keep them in the position that they are comfortable with they will usually protect their own um, spine uh, if they're conscious and then of course we want to think that we need to use x-rays sparingly um, but it's not it's, it's not un, like it's okay to do CT scans if we need to, but we don't need to do the entire trauma scan every time like we do sometimes in in elderly because they don't have the X-ray dose problem. All right, um, we talked about the for ACE in trauma. We talked about the different uh, sniffing position for small children. Um, the surgical airway is really hard to get, so we need to do other stuff. We talked about that already as well. Um, uh, it's really important to get a NG tube down into the um, stomach when we are doing anything with the airway because, as we talked about in dopes, if we're blowing up the stomach, then they may become toxic looking, especially the smaller children. Um, you get what you call diaphragmatic splinting, which creates hypoxemia and hypoventilation. And so, so it's really, really important to get get that uh, nasogastric tube into the patient if you're doing more than just a little back valve mass ventilation. For B, yeah, lung contusions can happen with even minimal findings and can occur after 48 hours, so they should oftentimes be observed, um, even though there are no injuries. Yeah. Um, for C, I guess um, we already talked about um, that if the patient is become, like they become tachycardic, if they be, do become bradycardic, then they are decompensated. If they do become hypotensive, then they're decompensated and they're in, in extremis. Um, um, we look at all the parameters CRT, pulse map, and pulses uh, like pulse filling, uh, so on and so forth, to, to evaluate whether or not they're in shock or if they're decompensated or compensated. Um, permissive hypertension, um, as we talked about, is something that EPELS talks about, but actually in the tra trauma, um, trauma Euro European trauma course and in EM cases, they talk about that, well, this P5 limit is not probably something that we should go for because when they do become hypertensive, they will decompensate these children. So what we actually want to do is we want the tachycardia to be... The, our, our goal, permissive tachycardia, so to speak. It's okay to let them be a little bit tachycardic, but not too much. Then I guess we will introduce the, the like blood on the floor and four more to uh, like algorithm to find um, bleedings. Um, and in small children, there is like it's kind of five more. You can you can also bleed out not only from your thorax, which is like the thorax, abdominal. Uh, cap, uh, cap, uh, cavity, your pelvis and your long bones, but also your head in small children because they have the fontanel that is <clears throat> not closed. I'm sorry. And then you can just keep bleeding without uh, there being compression. Um, the EFAS we talked about is not as good in children, um, but it's but you can look at the lungs. That's quite good. The D. Um, we talked about sclerora, which is spinal cord injury without radiographic abnormality, and lung contusions, like because they're soft. Um, vascular injuries and small wounds should be thoroughly examined because there might be um, big injury lowering below. And always think about non-accidental injuries, like someone is hurting the child. Okay, so. The European, that, that was just a, like a quick read through about <laughs> trauma in children. Um, so how, what's the, what does the algorithm look like? Well, 
We still have the five second round, what what they call in EPALS the quick look, and where the quick EPALS wants us to look for pneumothoraxes like asymmetric uh, pretesterized. Um, are they still breathing? So are they in cardiac arrest? Or and the major C, are there major bleedings that we need to take care of right now, like compress on bleedings or do tourniquets? And if there is an A problem or a B C problem, then we'll make the A or B C person do that, and then we'll get the report. And then we'll go on. In addition to all of these things in A, then we'll do MILS. Uh, I already talked about that um, earlier. It's like, like mobile inline stabilization. Um, someone at the head um, push on both shoulders of the patient um, with their with, with the patient's head in between their forearms, uh, making them stable. And then you have. Um, the C, we talk about blood on the floor and four more. So when you are going through these and you want to know, all right, I have a patient who mm, has a low blood pressure. Why do they have a low, low blood pressure or why do they have, why are they, are they tachycardic uh, from a bleeding standpoint? And then you think of blood on the floor and four more. So it's thorax, abdominal, abdominal cavity, pelvic region and long bones. And then the uh, and the it's usually four more but it can be five more if you count the retroperitoneum and an important thing about the retroperitoneum even though you've looked at all the four other cavities with pocus and with your eyes then the retroperitoneum cannot be looked at with pocus so you need a ct scan for that one and that's why if the if you haven't found a uh, source then you should usually do a ct scan even even so and then, as of course, it's actually six more for infants because their head can can um, um, bleed out. Then pelvic palpation is important, um, not so much in children, even like and even even in adults. I'm, so usually you palpate the chest, the pelvis first to check for instability or obvious signs of injury, and if you're not sure, then you uh, then you may press on the, press once on on the pelvic region to see if it's stable but in general you just bind the the you do a trochanter binder not it's it is it's called a pelvic binder but this should be over the trochanter you do a trochanter binder um just to be sure and then go to a cc scan because it's really hard to rule out all right um and then I guess I just wanted to bring in here, if you have someone who is low AVP, like someone who is decompensated, um, or or like there are two, re there are two, maybe three reasons in trauma why they are in have a low GCS or AVP. The first one is that they have a C problem; they're not perfusing, right? So what um, what options do we have here? Well. If you have a, if, if if that's a problem, you have a you have someone who's not um, mentating and it's because of a bleed, then you have to if the bleeding can be stopped, then stop the bleeding, press on the bleeding wherever it is, and then give the patient what has they have been lost, like in blood. But if you cannot stop the bleeding, like this is a really important distinction. Like can I, can I with my resuscitation efforts, can I, can I get the patient resuscitated to a point where they're, they're, we, we are catching up with the bleeding, or is the bleeding too fast that we cannot catch up? If we're bleeding too fast and we cannot catch up, then we need to get them somewhere right away to the OR uh, to stop the bleeding if we cannot do it in the emergency room. And this, this, this is where we, even though we kind of want to know where it's bleeding from, we cannot go to CT. We want to go to the OR to do an crash uh, exploration or an emergency exploration yeah um, so that's one reason um and that, and that, sorry and that's that's the reason for the fast scan the fast scan's purpose is to determine whether or not we should go to or or ct it's not to it's not a replacement for the ct um and then you have a d um so Either they're low because they're at low blood pressure and they're not perfusing, or it's because of a D problem. They have a brain injury, right? Um, and in that case, we want to be really careful with. Uh, they need to have. Um, they they uh, they 
I switched these around. They need to be at the P P fifty high, uh, blood pressure. They want you're not allowed to do permissive hypertension on these. They need high blood pressure. I think in adults and then in adults we say 110, 120. Um, usually, where permissive hypertension is like 80 or 90 uh, in these guys. All right. Um, the problem occurs when they have both a C and a D problem. So if they don't both have a head injury and you need to go to the OR to stop the bleeding, then what comes first? Well, you don't want to survive without a, a, a brain, but you don't want, want uh, <laughs> to bleed out because then you won't survive. So it's really that's really a hard problem. And, and you want uh, if you want to intubate them, um, then they're not allowed to get below that point of like permissive hypertension or sorry 110 120 for adults blood pressure if they have a head injury so it's really really hard they really need to aggressively resuscitate these patients okay and according to chris x who is a traumatologist he says that this is really really where people can get into arguments what comes first okay then just quick shock and trauma um of course we have the four maybe five kinds of shock you have to do hypovolemic shock and it's always good to be systematic about that because okay we have shock what's the cause well you always think this bleeding and trauma but it can be lots of causes right so the always think of the four, five causes like um, something before the heart so hypovolemia uh, that may be fluids or that might be blood it can be something on the heart like arrhythmogenic that's quite rare in the trauma um but they may be the cause of the trauma. Um, then you think about um, obstruction, and that's quite a common trauma. And, and it, it, that that's where it, like it doesn't help with blood, so you need you need to think about that and seek it out in the trauma. So uh, do they have tamponade? Do they have pneumothorax? Do they have um, some other um, like maybe we've blown too much air into their mediastinum and now they have like a, a obstructive uh, cause for that reason. And you have distributive, like uh, in trauma, that's usually neurogenic. And um, treatment there is uh, noradrenaline. And then you should always think about, the well, you have the dissociative causes, causes like carbon monoxide poisoning or anemia. And then you have your medical causes. So the, the reason for the trauma could be a medical cause, and that's really important to pick up. Yeah, and pain management, we already talked about that. For hemorrhage control, please check out this, like Cliff, Cliff Reed's YouTube channel and please check out first 10 EMs, um, like deep dive in the 441 or massive transfusion protocol. It seems like the evidence that we think there is, is not there. <laughs> um, instead, we should probably give more balanced foods often, more often, um, more, or like a give two liters of fluids, uh, or, or, sorry, of, um, of blood, and then see if it helps. And if it helps, then keep do doing on, and then kind of get get plasma in, on board as well. And uh, yeah, But don't you don't need to do the massive transfusion necessarily. If there's not a lot of evidence for it, at least. Um, but check his blog out to, to be like, make up your own mind. All right, so this is a great, great uh, like card to check out. Like what you do in bleeding, you turn off the tap. So you, have, you press on wherever it is, if you can press on it. Um, you may use topical something. You may, yeah, whatever you need to do. You have to get vascular access. If you cannot get IV within five minutes or two tries in pediatrics, then you do an IO. If it's in trauma or in cardiac arrest, then oftentimes you'll just do the IO. Um... Uh, at least if they're awake, uh, if they're not awake. If they're awake, it's a bit more complicated. Then usually you'll do um, lidocaine, half of the half of the um, you bore, and then you put in into the um, the connection tube. And then usually in adults, you put all the the fluids, like full full um, full connecting tube of uh, lidocaine, and push it. Um, in children, it's probably just half or a fourth of it, and then push it. Hemostatic resuscitation, that's the 441 or the or the more like balanced, um, depending on what on, on you want to do major transfusion protocol or the other one. Um, it's nice to know about the shock index here. I mean, the delta, delta shock index, how is patients doing at time zero versus time 
30 minutes versus time 60 minutes. And if you're, despite of us giving them all these fluids doing badly or going the wrong way or not or just barely stabilizing, then then we're in a problem. Um, and for children, it's like, then, then we're not catching up, then we might have to just go to the OR. Um, so there's, there's this perfect balance between resuscitating enough and then making the call. You don't want to be in the resource room too too long. And usually in the start, you say, we'll do this within five minutes or 10 minutes so that we have a plan. In children, you usually say, if they use, in e pulse they say, if we use 40 milliliters, bolus, milliliters per kilo boluses, like four bolus of blood, and we still haven't managed to re, like resuscitate the patient in according to our goals, then, um, then we should go to, to surgery. We reverse anticoagulation, that's usually not common in children, but in adults. And we optimize clotting by not, especially um, by not, um, it will give calcium, of course, and we'll keep them warm. Um, we'll manage pH, um, and um, but we'll not give uh, crystalloids uh, if we don't need it. And then you have here the specific measures for severe bleedings or how to turn off the tap. And you can check that out for yourself. All right. And here we have, yeah, the occult uh, again and decompensating compensated shocks. All right. Just quickly, the pelvic blind binder is, is actually a trochander binder. It should be placed over the trochander, then pulled. You can use anything, but like these trochander binders are good. And then once you have done that, you'll check for pulses, the penis, the pockets of the patient. Usually you'll put take the pants off though and then check for pain and then pulses again just to check these things that's a p five piece nothing in between like penis and pockets is so that you don't get penis problems pressure problems the tony case um so this is how you put in on a tony case uh, you have to drill it yourself and if it's still bleeding after one you put on two this is a um, this is a, um, a hair uh, or or uh, splints. Of if you have one of these bleedings where like you need to like one of the bigger bones in the body, then you have to splint it. This is the picture where you do the finger thoracotomy. Um, so the first picture here, you in the in the um, safe triangle. You can you either you go like if you have a pneumothorax and tensor pneumothorax, you go. Either on the fifth, like mammillary, like fifth rib, mammillary line on the on the lateral side here, or you say five finger, four or five fingers from the patient's hand, and then that's right below here. In children, it's better to do the mammillary line because that's usually like you can count on that, but you can't count on that on on in adults. Uh, and then in the epals, they wanted to do a needle. Um, thoracostomy, but uh, in most other resources, they want you to do a finger thoracotomy because it's easier and faster, and you always have that at, at hand. So, what you'll do is to do a for a finger thoracotomy, you'll mark the area. You may tranquilize if you need to. Then, in the fifth intercostal space, then you will, uh, or like five fingers beneath, beneath here, and then you will. Um, go in with the knife um, and uh, and then uh, cut a hole and once you cut a hole then you will use the, your your not a scissor but a, it's called a piang or a tweezer maybe I can't remember the uh, the name in in, in <laughs> mayo maybe uh, then you use this it's a blunt tool here um, it's not sharp and then you just push and then you usually have a hand here so that you don't push all the way through, but you'll have something to hold against. Push, and then you hear that you go through the floor. And once you've gone through the floor, you'll use your hands. Just that's the finger part of the finger thoracotomy. It's just get in your hand and then uh, feel for any adherences, and then um, then you have a hole. And you don't need to do anything about this anymore. Um, once you have time, you can do a chest strain, but that's not now. Uh, not if it's an emergency. All right, so we've gone through the entire thing here now. I will just talk about the syndromes because that's so important for emergency physicians to talk about. <laughs> so bear with me. This is not part of the ePulse course, even though we do 
are suspected to uh, or are expected to know some of the syndromes. So in general, in emergency medicine, we talk about the syndromes, right? So um, we, you, you can't keep going through treat as you go, A, B, C, D, because at some point you don't, you, the patient has an anaphylaxis and, and fluids can only give you, go, get you so far. So you need to pick up some data points and from these data points, we get some, we can call them um, star pictures, right? Or, or um, uh, star signs. And then from that we, we have oh that, that's probably a sin that's probably a syndrome that's a shock, what's what kind of shocks do we have then and we'll treat them. And and syndrome management makes us be able to treat more specifically so we don't have to choose, just do the generic oh just get fluids to someone who's hypertensive then we can do more specifically and then if that doesn't work we have to reevaluate re um is there something I'm not understanding and look at. Uh, Sarah Krager's blog for this amazing walkthrough about uh, this, or Uda Loops and Bread Baking, or some of my other blogs on decision making. All right, one last slide here. Um, I just wanted to show you this, like for these syndromes, for in pediatrics, like not like all pediatrics. Then I encourage you to buy some kind of book to have in your pocket, but or look at the guide, local guidelines, but for the major ones like dka like seizures like all of these look up this this has this has all the algorithms and it's e like it's a translation of the epals as written in a, an amazing great way so this is a, your friend look at this up all right so that's it and the the last bit you do is the sign out once you're done with the entire thing all right so um and through the th entire thing you've done, your non-technical skills, you're, you're, you have summarized and so on. So now we're in the end of the scenario and the case, and you want to sign out. And, and, and what do you go through in the EPALS and the ECC is the transport thing. And you, you're, what do you need for transport? Well, for the A's, you need, like, you need, well, I don't think it's so important to, like, for long transports, you really just need a checklist. For short transports, like to the CT scan, you need to know, you need to have a plan, what happens if this goes wrong, or what happens if, if this goes wrong, and have the drugs with you, uh, and the monitor with you for that. Um, yeah. And then you do a sign up, sign up with a team, that can be done in an SBAR fashion as well. Well, we had this patient with this background, what we're going to do is uh, go to the ICU, but first that's the scanners. And if is everything all right with that, okay. And the plan is if that if something happens in the scanner, then we'll do chest compressions, so on and so forth. Yeah, good. All right, thank you so much for listening. It wasn't as short as I thought, but I hope it was uh, meaningful. Um, thank you so much and uh, goodbye.